Um, good afternoon, everyone. Recording in progress. Um, am I audible? audible? Okay, um, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second day seminar session of the Coast South Conference 20 and 21. My name is Rizky Alif Alfian, and you can call me Alif, and I'm going to be the chair, the moderator, of this seminar session for the next approximately three hours. Um, this conference is organized by the Institute of International Studies and the Department of International Relations, Universitas Gajah Mada, initially conducted in 2015 to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Bandung Conference. This annual convention now focuses on the potential of and problems experienced by the Global South broadly defined. This year, the Go South Conference is generously supported by the AREA, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Established in 2017, AREA is an international organization providing support to the chair of the ASEAN Summit and the East Asia Summit through policy research focusing on three pillars, deepening economic integration, narrowing development gaps, and achieving sustainable development goals in the region. Um, this seminar session will be organized into two parts. In the first part, we will have three distinguished speakers deliver their brief lectures. After all of the speakers conclude their lectures, we will commence a question and answer session. Our speakers for these sessions are Uts Johan Pape from the World Bank. I wish I have pronounced um, your name correctly and my apologies if, if I have mistaken the pronunciation. And our second speakers is Dia Kusumaningrum from Universitas Gajah Mada. And the third speakers in the first part of the session is Franz Jalong from Universitas Gajah Mada. And in the second part of our session, we will have a speaker, Maria Tanyak, from the Australian National University, who will deliver a brief lecture and will be followed by a question and answer session. For the audience, if you have questions on the presentations, please type your questions in the chat box and I will read it when we enter the question and answer session. And you can also raise your hand to ask the question when we begin the question and answer session. Moving on to the first presentation, I wish to welcome um, Uts Johan Pape as the first um, speaker of this session. Uts Pape is a senior economist in the poverty and equity global practice and a global lead for data for operational impact or D4OI at the World Bank. He leads teams to design and implement lending projects to improve national statistical systems and to prepare analytical poverty work, including poverty assessments, poverty impact studies, and systematic country diagnostics. His work experience in post-conflict countries contributes to his research agenda, including the design of methodologies for poverty measurement in fragile settings. His research has received awards and is published in peer-reviewed peer journals including nature. In January 2020, he published a book with Johannes Hugeven on data collection and fragile states innovations from Africa. So welcome, um, Uts Johan Pape. How are you? Uh, thank you so much, Terima Kasi. I'm doing well. Can you hear me okay. well? Yes, um, your, your voice is crystal clear. So Uts, um, you have 20 minutes to deliver your presentation and I'm going to send you a reminder via the chat box when you pass the 15 and 20 minutes mark. So time is yours. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. And let me first apologize that I was not able to like um, give the presentation in the original slot, unfortunately, due to like an emergency that I had like no influence on. But I'm very glad that we managed to sort of um, still um, like basically put the presentation into the slots. And so to like really make sure that we use the time well, let me jump into it and start right away. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the digital economy 
uh, which of course fits very nicely into the overall topic of the um, of this event, um, and very specifically on how we can make sure that the digital economy and the digital opportunities that are created are harvested or like used not by only a certain subset of the population, but actually by everyone. So how can we make the digital economy work for everyone? And so you might have seen, we've published recently a report beyond unicorns, and that's exactly what I will talk about. The um, report was authored by Silas Tiwari, um, who's a very good colleague of mine, and of course with a big team behind him. Um, i just going to do the presentation because I was not as much involved in the digital economy report itself because I just very recently uh, moved actually to Indonesia. Um, so I hope you managed to see the first slide. So what are the different ways that, um, that um, people can benefit from in the um, digital economy? And so um, first, we need to sort of like look at... Oh, sorry, I'm still trying to figure out my screen here. Um, give me one second. <clears throat> From the, um, yeah, so, sorry. So what are the different ways that people can benefit from the digital economy? And so what the report does is it basically applies a very simple framework to look first at consumers. And consumers are, of course, um, people like you and me, and we can use digital for like a lot of different things. We can use it to stay connected with friends and family, think about Facebook. We can use it to um, basically um, have our finger on the pulse of the time, like what's happening in the world um, using Twitter, but of course also using other online news um, platforms. And of course, we can also like go beyond that and we can, for example, order from home um, services and goods. And um, so that's one of the first important parts um, of benefits um, that we can get from the digital economy. Now, the second one is as workers. As workers, the digital economy can create new jobs that then, of course, become available for workers. You can think about more sophisticated jobs, like, for example, working in artificial intelligence, which often people cons um, consider as being digital for zero. But you can also think in sort of like a much simpler way, for example, gig work. And that's much more important, for example, for Indonesia, where people suddenly feel that they have an ability of contributing to the economy, participating in the economy, not only as consumers, but actually as producers, as workers, and find new jobs there. Um, and we come back later to this, if you think about e-commerce, this of course plays a fundamental role because it suddenly allows you from basically almost like your living room to reach the world. And that plays a really important role. But of course, um, digital can also change existing jobs. And that's similarly important. It can make jobs more productive. And that of course often then also translates into higher wages. Finally, um, digital can... Um, you uh, can be benefited from as recipients of services. And here I would specifically think about government services. Um, and I'll give you a few quick examples. So for example, it can facilitate easier access to certain services. If you think, for example, um, about, um, let's say, cash transfers in times of an emergency like COVID-19, using digital and having the ability, for example, to digital payments and transactions um, just from phone to phone, this, of course, allows government to reach beneficiaries in much faster ways. And um, it can also help, for example, by targeting. So you can use digital capabilities of understanding who are the ones who actually were most um, affected by a certain disaster. And you can then select those using algorithms and then use, again, digital to reach them. And of course, also the quality of services can be improved. If you think about, for example, um, health tech um, some um, like people who live very remotely don't have access to a good hospital. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do to connect via um, remote or digital technologies to um, digital services. Um, and there's like this whole frame of, um, ed of health tech. Now, let's move to from like looking at it from who can benefit from it to um, what is basically the most fundamental part that you first need to have in place? And that's obviously connectivity. If you're not connected, you can't take advantage of the many opportunities that digital can bring. Um, Indonesia has made huge strides forward in the past, um, especially driven by investments from private investors in, in expanding network access. And I think that's all what like you, you all know about this. If you use your phone in Indonesia, you basically do have signal and you can use it almost everywhere. In fact, um, the fiber optic backbone has been completed, really connecting very remote regions um, to um, the backbone. 
um, for example, all the districts are now connected. Um, and that's, of course, really important, but also we can see generally that digital contributes to a very fast, like to the faster growing economy. Now, if you go a little bit more into detail, you can see like in 2011, 13% of adults were connected, while in 2019, uh, like one in two, like every second citizen is actually connected. Um, while this is sort of like a very positive message, of course, you can also just like turn the, uh, the coin around and it means, well, 49% are not yet connected. And these gaps are like really important to like look at and to understand, to understand what are the implications of such a unequal distribution of access to digital services. And I mean, I've just shown you all the like rich benefits that they can deliver, but you need to be connected for those. So what are the differences in um, terms of like people who can access it and who cannot access it? So for example, you can see a big split between urban and rural. Almost two in three people in the urban population are connected by only one uh, in three in the rural population. If you look by region, you can see huge differences. So for example, in, in, in Java, Bali, 55% are connected, while in Papua, only one third. And now the last one, um, that I want to show from these in this on the slide is um, by income. If you look at the 10th percent um, sort of like most wealthiest people in the society and compare them to the 10 um, percent bottom of the population, you can see huge differences. So the top income earners, they have five times more, they are five times more likely to have access to internet compared to the ones which are at the bottom of the income distribution. Um, and so affordability is obviously a key constraint. Now, if you look at how people are actually using it, you can see that um, pe most people in, in Indonesia connect to the internet using mobile internet rather than broadband. And if you look at the broadband internet connection, you can see that, well, Indonesia is not doing very well compared to regional peers. Um, and why is broadband so important. I mean, broadband is really important because you need it for large data volumes. And this means, for example, certain remote education applications, medical providers needed, government hospitals needed, but also firms in the IT sector. And then, of course, the ones who specialize in, in Digital 4.0, they are the ones who need definitely broadband access. And that's not something that is yet as much expanded in, um, in Indonesia as one uh, would have wished for. Now, affordability, I had already mentioned, and that is really important for inclusion. So in fact, we did conduct a specific survey for this report, and, uh, and you can see that almost one in two is mentioning that affordability is a key constraint in accessing broadband internet. And it's very interesting to see that a quarter of people only find that they don't need broadband in the sense because they already have a mobile internet. Um, and so this really points to like this affordability gap. Um, and you can also see that there are quite some differences between the, uh, the different regions. And so if you look a little bit and delve deeper into affordability, you can actually see that Indonesia is the 131st country out of 200 countries in the ITU ranking, uh, looking at the fixed line subscription fees. So in other words, the high cost is not only something that is perceived by the users, but it is also something that is factual the case if you compare it to, for example, regional peers or other countries. And so the cost problem, and we'll come back later to this in the end of the presentation, is really linked to the fundamental structure of the broadband market in Indonesia and the regulations, of course, that govern it. Um, quality is another um, important point that we need to discuss because quality is needed for uh, access to services. And it's, of course, very much linked to broadband versus mobile internet because speed um, and con um, like quick, um, quick response times is one of the, the main characteristics of quality. And you can see again, the international comparison for Indonesia, and it's definitely not one of the leaders uh, in, 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 in these um, dimensions. And um, again, just to like uh, emphasize, I mean, responsiveness and speed are really important for sort of like the higher end uh, digital applications, if you think about ha remote health care, if you think about education services, and of course they became, became really important in the current pandemic. Um, so let's see what users are actually doing in the internet. And um, so first you can see that Indonesia is the fifth most engaged country in the world in terms of like the intensity of using internet, right behind 
the Philippines, Brazil, Thailand, and Colombia. So in fact, Indonesia, the intensity of use of internet is 21.8% above the global average. And this is really important to sort of like think a little bit about because this also means that Indonesia is a really important market, uh, for example, for content developers, but also, for example, for advertisers and everybody else who, um, who can benefit from the digital economy. Um, so on average, and this is based on a survey that we had conducted specifically for the study, as I'd mentioned, um, you can see how people are, like what kind of, um, let's say services people are using when they connect um, uh, online. And 36%, like one third is communications, a big chunk is social media, but also leisure plays, um, plays a really important, um, plays a, a really important role. Um, on average, Indonesians spend six hours online. And that's, of course, just the average, and it's not uniform across the population, particularly the younger ones and the higher skilled ones, they are spending more time online. So in fact, if you look at the 16 to 25 year old ones, so like a, the, the rather very young adults, they spend almost 10 hours online per day. Um, now, all of these numbers, they are um, sort of like um, coming from a survey conducted before COVID-19. So these numbers might have changed here and there, but we feel they still give you like an important idea of like what has been going on and in which direction it has likely been involved. Now moving to e-commerce, and so on this slide, you can see that well, buying and selling only plays a small part uh, in terms of like the time commitment, but in general, e-commerce is really important in Indonesia um, because it's one of the main drivers of like the digital economy itself. Um, what are the benefits from e-commerce? And you can see them a little bit on the lower left side in the graph. Um, prices obviously play a big role. People can um, purchase goods and services for much cheaper because they've got more um, different providers and therefore there's more competition. But of course, also convenience is really important. And that um, you can just like imagine it because, well, sitting and ordering from your couch is just much easier than walking somewhere to get um, the goods or services. But then, of course, product variety, which also is very closely linked to local non-availability, is really important because suddenly you can tap, and I've mentioned this before, in like the big market that you can reach with e-commerce, you can basically tap into a large, much larger market. And you can see that different um, regions in Indonesia benefit from these different um, parts of, um, of e-commerce in different ways. Um, so I'll just like give you a few examples, like ride hailing, of course, is also like very important, um, but it depends really crucially on the connectivity services that I think all of you know who has lost connection while calling for or like using the ride hailing apps. Um, but in Indonesia, they're like really widely used. One in four Indonesians use them, almost two in five urban dwellers, and a lot actually use them for the daily commute. But it doesn't stop there. Um, in terms of like just usage, it's really about the implications that come from like, for example, rate hailing, uh, ride hailing apps. And as you probably know, the labor market in Indonesia has always been rather fragmented. But suddenly with this better and new mode of transportation, um, it helps to basically overcome to some extent the fragmented labor market. And therefore, like these uh, services offered digitally do not only have direct benefits from the user, but you can see how they basically translate into much bigger changes and transformative changes in the economy. But it's not just about ride hailing apps. Uh, on the right hand side of the slide, you can see it's also like about, for example, ordering food. And that's something that a lot of ride hailing apps actually tapped into uh, um, um, to offer to their um, to offer to their um, customers. Now, what does it mean um, for workers? And there was sort of you no know, like the second big point that I had at the beginning of the slide deck. Um, so for workers, um, we can focus very much at the beginning, at least on digital gig work, because that's really important for, for the um, digital economy in, in Indonesia. And a lot of people, they actually say they use the digital gig work because it's more flexible. So that's like one of the main attributes that people see as a benefit. Uh, interestingly, one third of gig workers use the digital gig work as their first job. So in a sense, you can say that gig work emerges as a stepping stone into the labor market, especially for young Indonesians. Uh, relative to other jobs, gig work does pay better, but also gig workers, they work very hard on average. And you can see as on the slide, they work 10 hours more than other types of workers. But interestingly, and really importantly for this presentation, um, gig work is not available for everybody. 85% of digital workers are men, 
87% are living in urban areas, and 69% are working in one specific sector, transportation, storage, and communication. And so this, again, shows you that not everybody benefits from digital, and that's something we come back to in a minute when we talk about the implications of these findings. But before, let's look again at e-commerce, because e-commerce, of course, is also generating a lot of opportunities. But again, we also see uh, quite a number of challenges. So 10% of the population are using e-commerce, um, which is well quite a substantial number given the population of Indonesia, but 10% is also relatively seen rather low. And um, so what are the constraints? Or like before we go to the constraints, let me delve a little bit deeper into this um, because I see I've got a little bit more time. Um, so e-commerce is really important, not um, just sort of like for everybody, but specifically for women. And that's what we see from our survey. So a lot of people generally use e-commerce as a secondary job rather than a primary job, meaning that it has a useful role in supplementing, for example, family income. But we also see that especially women take advantage of this um, who often have the primary responsibility as household work uh, and then engage in e-commerce as a secondary job. So in a sense, e-commerce has managed to change the dynamics in the economy that like no traditionally has struggled quite a bit to activate women into the labor market. And so while e-commerce has increased and spread all over the country, while its intensity is not the same everywhere, it is really focused on the most populous areas. Um, but so it is important to expand e-commerce and its availability across um, the country. Um, but there are a couple of constraints. And the first one really is the cost of logistics, because if you cannot transport a good from A to B, well, ordering it online also doesn't uh, help much. Um, connectivity, the third one, is of course important, but I've said a lot on this already. But then another one which comes out here is the limited trust in digital payments and service or transactions. And what we've seen is, for example, that even though people order online, half of them still want to pay um, with cash. And this, of course, really limits of what you can do in terms of transactions. And I come back to this uh, in a second again. Um, now, generally, we see <clears throat> that particularly small and micro firms have a low adoption of digital. And that's, of course, a problem because they are, of course, um, playing a really important role in, 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 in the economy of creating jobs. While this might have changed in the pandemic a little bit, we don't think that it has like fundamentally changed. So I think the patterns are probably still true. Um, and so one question, of course, to ask is like, which firms are the ones who are winning from digital economy? And we can see that the ones who are winning are really the firms who are owned and operated by higher educated workers with longer entrepreneurial experience. And so again, here we see that skilled workers basically benefit more from the digital economy, which of course is really important to keep in mind um, if you talk about equity of the opportunities. Now we're gonna sort of like switch gears, go a little bit faster, <clears throat> quickly think a little bit about the recipient of government services that have benefited from, um, from in, uh, like Indonesia from digital. Digital has really played an important role. Edutech high, and, uh, and the um, health tech sectors have played an important role. But what we see is that often these private sector-led innovations have not been adopted at scale. And we know from international experiences that adopting those at scale is really what makes it transformative in terms of also like using them for government services. The main constraint is, and I've mentioned this before, still connectivity, especially uh, for, for like a large number of these services. However, a second constraint is digital identification. And I've sort of like alluded a little bit to this when I talked about the trust and financial uh, interactions that are made online. Of course, if you can rely on knowing who someone is, and that's digital identification, then um, that is really important. We call it a low hanging fruit here because Indonesia already has a very good national ID system, and so it would be not so difficult to jump on that and utilize this further. Um, now, finally, while the government has made a lot of push towards um, uh, digitalization, and I mean, you're all probably aware of the one data policy and other things put in place, um, so we have a framework, but still a lot of solutions are basically offered um, very much at the sectoral level. And we don't see much that is going beyond, uh, like across the whole government. Um, and that could really make the transformation complete. And so we feel that um, having more, like overcoming this fragmentation, especially the lack of coordination leadership would be really important on the way forward. So with that, let me um, jump to my last couple of slides and I should be finished in like one minute. What can be done in terms of policy? Um, so first, 
we've got three different big um, recommendations. Improve digital connectivity and universalize access. Second, make the digital economy work for all. And third, use digital technologies to upgrade services. I'm just going to go very quickly over some of the sort of like more detailed points here. On the first one, improving connectivity, for example, it's really important to optimize the spectrum and really complete the switch from analog to digital. I mean, you might know there's a 700 megahertz um, spectrum, which is really important for rural propagation of the, of the internet or like the online signal. And that's something that needs to be freed up. High frequency spectrum needs to be optimized further. But it's also about strengthening the sharing of active and passive infrastructure. This would allow new service providers to jump in with much lower initial investment costs and therefore, of course, um, provide more services with better quality and create competition in the field. And then the last one goes exactly along those lines of creating competition. Um, we feel that, for example, a unified licensing approach would be really important so that one digital provider can offer not only one service, but a whole portfolio of services. And again, that would help in terms of, um, in terms of um, quality and price of services. Second, make the digital economy work for all. Um, logistics, I'd already mentioned that they need to be improved. Financial inclusion is really important. Digital ID can help here very much, but also about boosting digital skills for the digital economy to make sure that actually everybody can take care of this, uh, can take advantage of these opportunities. And finally, but now I'm not going to go into detail here, tax policy instruments to ensure a level playing field. Now, finally, the use of digital technologies, and I've already mentioned most of them, develop a national ID framework but also embrace a whole of government approach for the digital transformation. And then of course, move towards um, data integration and data management so that better services can be provided. So that's it, let me stop here. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope I didn't rush through too much and too quickly, but there's a link on the slide deck, um, Digital Indonesia at the World Bank website, and um, you can find the full report. And I really encourage you to read it because it has a wealth of information and I could just like sort of like jump a little bit over the details. But as you can see, we feel digital can be a really important part for Indonesia, but we need to make sure that the opportunities from digital can be reaped by everybody. And this requires policy actions that I have pointed out. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Utz. That is um, an extremely interesting presentation. Um, to simplify and to summarize what you have presented before, um, I think this presentation has shown that connectivity, increasing connectivity in Indonesia um, will be a very good and strategic policy choice in order um, to expand the benefit of digital technologies for consumers, workers, and including also for the citizens. However, there have been several obstacles that hinder this possible um, potential. And the World Bank and OATS have proposed three broad policies, op policy options that can be taken by the government. That is to strengthen connectivity and universalize access and to ensure that the digital economy work for everyone. And the last strategic option is to use digital technologies and to expand the use of digital technologies in order to upgrade the quality of services. Thank you very much um, for giving us that presentation. Uh, for the audience, if you have questions, you can type your question in the chat box and I will read that when we commence the question and answer session. But for now, we will move on to the second presentation. Um, our second presenter is Dia Kusuma Lingrum from the Universitas Gajah Mada. Dia Kusuma Lingrum is a lecturer at the Department of IR at Universitas Gajah Mada, and she is amongst the recipients of the 2020 Peace Research Grant from the International Peace Research Association Foundation. Her notable work includes the reconceptualization of everyday reconciliation and Damai Pangkal Damai, or DBD, a database project that records nonviolent actions in Indonesia. DBD's monthly recapitulation and annual report on nonviolent resistance in Indonesia and worldwide can be accessed through Institute of International Studies website and social media. Um, Dia, you are going to have 20 minutes um, for presentation, and I'm going to send you a message um, indicating when you have passed the 15 and 20 minutes mark. The time and place is yours. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ali, for the very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, organizers, for inviting me, and thank you, everyone, for making the time to attend uh, this session. Um, I plan to do a bit of uh, bitching and pitching on universities' possible roles in bringing about a more just post-pandemic world. So here I'd like to first acknowledge the valuable contribution of my research assistant, Ms. Dania Salsha, uh, as well as my partners in crime, Dr. Da Daniel Petz and Dr. Gerard Lin from University of Graz, uh, Austria. Um, the working title for my presentation is uh, Bitching and Pitching uh, Universities as Motors for Social Justice. So let me start by bitching about normalcy. The further we go into the pandemic, the more we hear statements, wishes, prayers, and such, longing for a return to normalcy. As early as April 2020, the term new normal started circulating. In Indonesia, and perhaps in some other places, it entails um, performing one's day-to-day -day routines while exercising unprecedented precautions. It means going back to shopping, eating, traveling, doing sports, working, attending classes, and so on, while wearing masks, maintaining a distance from one another, regularly washing hands, and instilling other health protocols. Is it so wrong to long for something familiar and normal? Well, not necessarily. But what if that very things we see as familiar and normal are actually not normal at all, and we're actually not that familiar about the intricate structures and cultures that underpin them. One and a half year into the pandemic, it has now become clearer and clearer that what we're facing is not just a health crisis. As many have pointed out, the pandemic has exposed us to the chronic injustices that's been all around us all this time. At this point, I hope you agree with me that there's nothing normal about a country not having universal health care. There's nothing normal about the way we fail to economically reward the labor of love of our spouses, elders, neighbors, and such. There's nothing normal about governments failing to effectively perform risk communication. There's nothing normal about privileging certain white collar professions while failing to provide job security, economic dignity to the most essential workers that have kept things running throughout this pandemic. I'm referring to the undertakers, the sanitation workers, delivery workers, shopkeepers, folks in the gas stations, farmers, staff who run the old people's home, uh, those who run daycare facilities for children and such. There's nothing normal about allowing only a few people from a certain sex, age, color, sexual orientation, and class to make decisions for the 99%. There's nothing normal about sticking to fossil fuel when our only home, planet Earth, is dying. I can go on and on and on on this, and I believe that all of you can add to the list. But I'll stop here and ask, do we really want to go back to those arrangements, knowing well that they are the ones that had allowed for the coronavirus to spread, to infect, and to mutate in such a crazy manner? I remember how mixed the message was back then when teaching had to be switched from in-class uh, to online. On the one hand, it seemed that we were told to brace for something big, unprecedented, uncontrollable, basically a major game changer. On the other hand, it also seemed that we were told to continue our gigs in the least disruptive way. So is it a huge thing, a crisis, that requires us to radically change the way we do things, or it's just a thing in which we are allowed to or are even encouraged to carry on as much as we can with the usual ways of doing things. It was indeed confusing. It's like moving from business as usual to crisis as usual. And since many things are thrown at our direction from learning new technologies, colliding workspace and domestic spaces to uh, hearing sad news about this loved ones and that loved ones and such, it was easier to long for the old ways of doing things. 
while internalizing that those seemingly familiar arrangements are normal. It is way easier than to admit that there's nothing normal about the injustices that underpins and that are reinforced by the ways we've been doing things. This is way easier than to radically dream and to work on just ways to do things and on um, the just ways to collectively move forward. Here I emphasize not only the word just on the need for justice, I also emphasize on the word collectively, on the need to meaningfully locate all of this in the domain, in the realm of the collective. It doesn't make sense that the bulk of the solutions to such a systemic mess is placed at individual responsibilities to wear masks, to wash hands, to get vaccinated, and so on. I do all of those things voluntarily, and I hope all of you do those things as well. But if we as individuals are asked to bear such duties, it's only fair that governments, international organizations, corporations, the media, universities, and so on, are held accountable for putting us into the chronic structures and cultures of injustices that enabled a virus to feed off from our vulnerabilities and notably from the most vulnerable among us, mostly part of the global south. Okay, enough bitching, let's move to pitching. Here, I borrow Arundhati's Roy idea that this very pandemic we're facing is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. Here we are faced with a choice to walk through the portal while dragging hazardous, poisonous, explosive baggage or to walk through with little baggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Of course, I'd like to see all of us choosing the latter. And since there are many things to imagine and to fight for, this time I'd like to focus on how universities could and should bring about this new, more just world. I'd like to offer four ideas, hoping that you would bring in more ideas and believing that are, there are even more ideas out there. These four are pedagogies of resistance, unions, going beyond inclusion and intersectionality, and social justice anxieties. First up, pedagogies of resistance. Growing up in Indonesia and in the Philippines, I was at the receiving end of history lessons that glorifies the struggles for independence. I assume this is uh, an experience that is widely shared by many in the Global South. The thing is, the very same curricula has little or even no respect <laughs> for <laughs> other struggles against injustices. There's almost nothing about the struggles of indigenous communities and environmentalists against deforestation and land grabbing. There's almost nothing about the struggles of uh, workers for a fair share of the economic benefits they co-produce. There's almost nothing about the struggles of ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities for recognition and equal rights. There's almost nothing about the struggles of climate activists to leave behind fossil fuel. There's almost nothing about the struggles of students and other CSOs against discriminatory laws imposed by governments. Not only that such struggles were not given space in the curricula, they are not modeled, let alone championed in the everyday business of academia. From early on, universities instill students with FOMO, fear of missing out on the shiny things offered by governments uh, and industries, scholarships, internships, mentorship, training, employment, etc. Here, universities open up their gates widely, allowing those institutions to set mini offices on campus to fund a number of key research, to hold job fairs, to headhunt for the creme a la creme, to hire teaching staff as consultants, and so on. This may be okay if the downtrodden were given the same treatment. If universities meaningfully take a stake in the survival and well-being of these communities, this may be okay if partnerships with the downtrodden is considered as strategic and as valuable as those of the government and corporations. But more often than not, these engagements reflect a hierarchy. Here, government and university, sorry, here, uh, government offices and corporations are at the top 
portrayed as being so generous to extend their resources to universities. And here, the communities are put at the bottom of the hierarchy, portrayed as being so lucky to have the helping hands of the university. Implicitly, universities teach students to discipline themselves in such a way that would allow them to easily pursue vertical mobility in such a way that would allow them to escape the fate of the downtrodden. All this plus a somewhat illusion that the better off you are in a society, the more well positioned you are to help those who are worse off. What about critical thinking? Well, as much as it may be taught and encouraged in universities, it seems that it does not translate well to action. Universities tend to prefer to raise grievances, disagreements and such using polished and elegant uh, policy recommendations while discrediting students, workers and others who choose to raise dissent through demonstrations, strikes, boycotts, art forms and such. Indeed, we do see universities issuing statements prohibiting students and staff to engage in um, demonstrations and such activities. There's been explicit statements and even indicators in the higher education accreditation system that the curricula in universities need to be compatible with the job market. At a superficial level, there seems to be nothing wrong with wanting fresh graduates to immediately have jobs and not adding to the unemployment statistics. But where's the explicit statement and accreditation points for producing graduates who are passionate and skillful in being meaningful allies to the downtrodden? None. For the last 15 years, we've been experiencing a global decline of democracy. In the last 10 years, we've seen the rise of right-wing movements. Year after year, we continue to witness intimidation and assault of journalists, human rights defenders, and climate activists. While a good amount of individuals, faculty members, staff, and students lend themselves to the cause, more often than not, universities institutionally tend to fall short in providing public leadership in defending democracy. So we need pedagogies of resistance, andragogies of resistance, that take as normal, not as subversive, not as criminal, the efforts to stand up against injustices. In Jean Sharp's categorization, there are 198 methods of nonviolent action. But the value of teaching about them cognitively in classrooms is limited without fostering attitudes and modeling skills for calling out injustices, for holding those in power accountable. Moving on to number two, which is about unions. Among the many things that colonialism has stripped out from societies in the global south is the ability to effectively organize. Labor unions do exist in the global south, but their effectiveness in pushing their members' agendas is arguably lower than that of unions in the global north. In the global south, the nature of the collective is small more associational, more corporatist, and not quite union-like. We have students' associations, lecturers' associations, civil servants' associations, journalists' associations, neighborhood associations, and so on. And while they do have internal decision-making processes and external communication uh, functions, unfortunately, they tend to lack the spirit of wanting to stick it to the man. Um, again, we see that FOMO is being instilled. People join associations and behave accordingly out of the fear of missing out on the various spoils and benefits that the association may receive from high up. Arguably, the very idea that unionizing is about calling out injustices and holding those in power accountable has been lost. We need to encourage meaningful student unions, even when it means that these unions are there to hold us accountable, that these unions would insist that students be included in various university policy making processes. If students never embody the need to unionize, it is very unlikely that they will enter or form meaningful unions in the future. We, the staff, both teaching and non-teaching staff, need to unionize. If anything, 
the associations we have in universities have shaped us to accept the system, to accept the ways the system compensates for the harms it brings rather than shaping us to challenge the system to be more just. Only by unionizing that we can guarantee job security, dignified wage and comprehensive health care for the most essential and or vulnerable among us, the janitors, the security guards, the librarians, the adjuncts, the new hires, the ones with disabilities, the ones coming from ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities, and such. There is no way we can inspire our students to challenge the distribution system out there that favors the 1% if we don't challenge such distribution in here, in our very campuses. If we never model the importance of fighting for a more just distribution, what are the chances that students will find it worthwhile to do so? Only by unionizing that we can push universities to divest from fossil fuel industry, to truthfully teach climate science and to forcefully push for climate justice agendas. While we are thrilled about Harvard's decision um, to divest from fossil fuel industries, it's really the students and staff and activists who have relentlessly protested who deserve the most credit. One can argue that Harvard elites would have not divested had there been no constant protest and pressures, because otherwise Harvard would have done it years ago, decades ago, when climate uh, science had made it clear that fossil fuel has uh, brought us to the brink of not only destruction, but also extinction. While universities um, in the global South may not have endowments as big as those acquired by Ivy League campuses, they do receive scholarships, donations, uh, research funds, and so on. And I'm not sure uh, our universities will see it as their civic duty to stop supporting fossil fuel. And that's why we need to pressure campus leadership to do so only by unionizing that we can kick out racism and sexism from campus. If it wasn't for the constant protest of faculty members, um, staff members, students, and so on, it is very likely that universities will keep sex offenders, bigots, and such on their payroll and silence any complaints pertaining to harassments and assaults, and so on and so forth. In a nutshell, we need to take as normal not as subversive, not as criminal efforts to unionize. Only by doing so that we can shape the various decisions on campus to reflect our needs rather than the needs of the 1%. Next, number three, we need to go uh, beyond inclusion and intersectionality. Um, throughout the last decades, we've seen civil society movements pushing for inclusion and putting forward uh, an in intersectional lens to make sure that the fight for justice does not leave behind or even sacrifice the need of any uh, particular collective. I'd like to argue that we need to go beyond that uh, in the sense that inclusion and intersectionality should not just be about our FOMO, our fear of missing out on embracing and performing political correctness. More than that, it should be geared towards reparation. Um, so while universities provide affirmative action and scholarships to those socially, economically, and physically challenged, why not extend the support to the very communities that the universities have harmed or helped harm? Universities need to think about how to best support, for example, the children and grandchildren of political dissidents, uh, the families whose land were taken from them to build airports, highways, universities, and such, the ex-prisoners and ex-combatants who are trying to reintegrate the society, the elders who did not have the chance to complete or even pursue higher education because they were taking care of their families, and so on and so forth. We need to acknowledge that universities have caused harm to communities, uh, or at least help governments and corporations to do so. And with this in mind, universities need to push the principles of inclusion and intersectionality further to build more just and meaningful relations with the society. We need to take as normal, not as an embarrassment, not as a defeat, efforts aimed at reparation. Lastly, number four, social justice anxieties. 
in my nearly 20 years of working at Universitas Gajah Mada, I witness more and more students and colleagues suffer from mental health problems. I myself have also suffered some mental um, health issues. On the other hand, I am happy to see how universities and societies increasingly take this matter seriously. On the other hand, I am quite disappointed that the bulk of responses towards mental health issues highlights individual responsibilities. Here, individuals who suffer from mental health issues are asked, are facilitated to identify the root causes, the trigger factors, the possible support system, and so on, and then are asked and are facilitated to acquire the skills to overcome those issues. At the same time, other individuals are asked, are trained to identify how he or she can negatively or positively contribute to someone's mental health problem. So just like the COVID-19 remedy of wearing masks, washing hands, getting vaccinated, and so on, the bulk of the remedies against mental health issues is placed at the hands of the individuals. The message is clear. It's the individuals who are asked to step up the game as survivors, peer counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, occupational therapists, family members, and so on. Here we see how mental health issues are relegated to an individual's lack of something or his or her social circle's lack of something, rather than a collective sense of social dislocation brought by the structures and cultures of injustices. The current neoliberal system has instilled a certain degree of FOMO, fear of missing out on the various opportunities, rewards, and promises of success and happiness. We need a way of addressing mental health issues as social justice anxieties so that we can tackle the core of the problem that lays on the banality of the system, not in the shortcoming of individuals. It doesn't make sense to see universities, on the one hand, strengthening the neoliberal system that is at the core of social justice anxieties, while on the other hand, advocating for mental uh, health that has a lot to do with the social dislocations and disillusionment brought by neoliberalism. We need to take as normal, as obvious consequences, not as weaknesses, the anxieties that rise in response to injustices. Here we need uh, to not treat the symptoms, but to mainly eradicate the virus, the bacteria, the parasite that is the political, economic, and social injustices all around us. Okay, I know time is up. Uh, this is where I should wrap up, but instead let me throw in a bit of a curveball. Yes, Arundhati Roy has dared us to see this pandemic as a portal to build a new world. If only we can bring ourselves to collectively dream about it and fight for it. But Naomi Klein, who I also very much admire, has warned us about the shock doctrine of the recurring pattern of certain leaders and neoliberal institutions using severe crisis to induce policies that they claim would serve as remedies to the crisis, but instead put all of us in a more vulnerable place. So here I post a question, will universities be able to recognize this recurring uh, pattern? And will universities be able to call out on the bullshit remedies? So thank you and take care. Um, thank you very much for this extremely interesting presentation. Um, to summarize and again to simplify um, the idea that has been articulated by Dia, she argues that we have to rethink our notion of normalcy despite our desire to return to, the, to our pre-pandemic life, which we have considered as the normal condition. Those condition that we have been considered as normal is actually abnormal given that we have multiple conditions that are to an extent irrational for example the absence of universal healthcare the absence of dignity respect protection for workers that have been proven to be extremely essential for our social life in that way um, dia proposed university as a possible site of transformation proposing for strategies that those which are pedagogies, pedagogies of resistance and then unionization, reparation, and the normalization of anxiety caused by the social injustices. Thank you very much for the presentation. And now we are moving 
to our third and last presenter in the first part of our um, seminar session. Our third speaker is Franz Jalong, who is a lecturer at the Department of Sociology, Universitas Gajah Mada, and a senior researcher at the Center of Peace and Security Studies, or CSPS. His area of expertise includes conflict resolution, democracy, political sociology, political economy of development, and global sociology. France has had an extensive list of publications concerning the global south, including Path to Peace, containing discourses on communal violence and conflict in the post-New Order Indonesia, and Diversity, Democratization, and Indonesian Leadership. His most recent co-edited book was just released this month, entitled Pandemi, Conflict, and Transformasi, or Pandemi, Conflict, and Transformation. Um, France, you have 20 minutes for presenting um, your lectures. And again, I will indicate via the chat box if you have passed the 15 minutes and 20 minutes mark. The time is yours. Uh, thank you, Alif. Am I audible, Alif and friends? Yes, very clear. Okay, thank you. Because now I'm in the third floor of the uh, uh, Faculty of uh, Social and Political Faculty, so in the building. So I think uh, this is quite strong uh, uh, waves for this communication. Uh, again, I uh, or let me begin by saying thank you for the for the committee uh, for having me and for inviting me here. It's a great uh, honor for me to have a chance to talk or to share um, my ideas, especially my ideas in relation with Mas Aim, what uh, we have been developing in the last few years. And also uh, having the chance to listen to other speakers with their uh, insightful thoughts and uh, uh, possible scenarios that uh, uh, should be taken in order to prevent uh, what uh, going wrong in the future. So the question that I want to answer in this uh, session, especially for me, is a uh, is big one. This is why uh, we need to see that the Global South matters most for us in the context of pandemics and how best we understand it uh, in relation to the quite complex and dramatic change in uh, our current geopolitical uh, uh, affairs. So um, what I'm trying to do now is, I just want to, in, in the very start, I want to make clear that, uh, or to propose or tell you my a number of uh, like uh, concluding, not concluding, but uh, argument, uh, not to scare you, but to remind you how, how dangerous we are now in uh, context of uh, when we uh, discuss about pandemic in the context of geopolitics. I mean, looking at the pandemics, not as a only as a health crisis, but as part of the crisis in a broader sense of in the world, meaning co political economic conflict, interstate conflict, and how it impact uh, uh, global south, especially Indonesia too. So the important things that we need to keep in mind today is uh, that during the pandemic, we are witnessing a further and deepening precariations of global South working class. This is the most important. We are talking about human beings. We are talking about productive forces uh, that now being situated in the conditions of, uh, of or situated in economic conditions uh, which not being protected, but being led, uh, drawn into an economic uncertainty by the state policies, either from at the from the global uh, instructions uh, and then being implemented by the 
by the state uh, in the region, especially in the global south. And this phenomenon of precarization is, I mean, cannot be debated. I think it's a fact. But if you try to think that it is not uh, a serious thing, it means that you are not living in the global south. And you can start looking at this phenomenon from your neighborhood, then to level of community, level of the state, and then level of the region. And you see how this has become a common place. And uh, uh, to what extent it leads us in the sense of social conflict and so forth, uh, let's talk later. The second thing I think uh, is very important is geopolitical contest between United States and China in, during the pandemics. It is not only about two states, not only about United States with Washington as its capital and also, also China with Beijing as its capital. Okay? It's about this, you can say, I think those uh, in, in international relations uh, uh, know well, even more than me about that that when we're talking about the uh, United States, we talk about the empire uh, since the, the since post-Cold War, uh, since uh, Second World War. And now it, uh, in the last 20 years, it turns out to be a, a kind of big empire. And uh, in the last few years, especially during the pandemics, uh, resist to be dying, um, resist to be uh, in a competition with the China. And, and the point is this kind of contest between China, when you talk about China, you talk about Russia, you talk about uh, uh, Central Asia, you talk about Middle East, that now more and more state there being connected and being integrated into China's uh, economic and, and security arrangement uh, as an alliance. Uh, so you see uh, that China with its alliance and United States with its all, with its all alliance, I mean, European uh, European states and also Australia, Canada, and Japan, of course, and other its proxy states. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, weaker and weaker, those states in the uh, Middle East and other parts of the world. So these two uh, geopolitical powers in contest is very serious. And I, I want to argue since the start is that this kind of contest might be leading into the nuclear war. Not in the sense of like we talk about the dangers of nuclear war as we use a common approach in uh, either in global sociology or in international relations, but as I and must I develop uh, lately, we think this is uh, only be possible or can, can be understood if we use another kind of approach to see this possibility. And that's what I am going to talk later. And then, we have, so with this kind of precariations of uh, Global South productive forces, I mean, the people of the Global South, and also uh, the contest between uh, competing, two competing uh, powers, uh, China and uh, China and United States, and it taking place around us in the, uh, in the global, global South region, especially in uh, Southeast Asia and also in Central Asia. So it's, 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 it's clear that it is directly in, impacted on us and we, we cannot avoid it. The question is, or, or if I want to formulate it well, is here. We have a problem of democracy because work, global South working class not being present, represented in this, kind of, in this kind of contest, in this kind of precarization caused by this pandemic. Because all, almost all the states in the countries, except um, if I'm talking about Singapore and Japan and, uh, uh, and, and, and China, almost countries in the region really like to be integrated into this pandemic governance, uh, crisis governance. Okay? And when we talk about uh, global crisis governance in, 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 cons in the context of the health crisis, meaning that we are... Look we are we, we are talking about the uh, uh, World Health Organization's uh, dictums or dictates, and, and that's a contested and uh, 
we can also debate about that to what extent it's really international or it's part of the big business process in big farmers and it's uh, in its uh, networks of uh, billionaires with their um, technological investment so that's that's where we have to take stand because uh, democracy is in danger in global uh, in uh, global south because uh, uh, most more and more states in the region uh, tends to be integrated into this kind of uh, a crisis governance or uh, governance of crisis is permanent i mean crisis is permanent in order for the uh, uh, total control to be in place uh, and uh, and for democracy to be uh, to be uh, at the jet then i mean to be not no longer be the political forces of the people in the, in uh, to to bargain or to participate in the political arena so that's that's here we have a democracy in danger and the second is the danger if the state not consolidated in the global south it requires rethinking about how state in state to state relation or either bilateral or uh, multilateral interactions among state in the global south needs to be rethink in the context of such a conflict uh, between two superpowers and also in the context of uh, domestic constructions in their countries that affects other countries caused by this uh, internal problems of democracy and also by the interstate problems of geopolitical affairs in the regions this is why it's important global south needs to be re rethought and uh, and uh, be considered in our uh, uh, further advocacy so here uh, that, that's that, that's my my the, the, the big point that's why uh, global south matters but in order to understand that uh, i want to approach this uh, i want to explore this uh, these two points that i've mentioned before um, by inviting you my dear friends to look at the nature of pandemics today because we need to settle down and think uh, um, either uh, in the same way or either in different way, but uh, uh, the purpose is to have a, a variety of ways in understanding that uh, uh, what is going on uh, in the last uh, uh, one and a half years. Okay, and uh, in in my or our review, I, we have uh, uh, we have found that uh, there are numbers of approaches or ways of thinking in, in understanding or making sense of this pandemic, especially uh, for us in, uh, in, the, in academic worlds or in those relating to the public, uh, public discussion. So first of all, I think this is very common, uh, is that uh, uh, pandemic relating to, you know, like a crisis in a global governance, that's uh, catching, catching for all uh, uh, terms, yeah? global governance in crisis, as if uh, the, the, the global governance is uh, experiencing crisis just now, but not before, you know? While in fact, that's the story that we want to tell you. That the, the story of the crisis uh, has been rooted uh, uh, long before, or at least in the last uh, 20 years in uh, global war on terror. And then, um, and this, this kind of approach is okay. Uh, I'm not debating those who hold or uh, keep the, this uh, approach, but this is very important approach as an uh, opening in understanding. But uh, we hope that uh, this kind of notion of uh, global governance uh, in crisis uh, uh, not uh, distract our attention for, from what is going on inside this pandemic uh, in terms of political economy and geopolitics, also uh, geoeconomy and geosecurity. The second one is a uh, notion of, I'm sorry. The second is uh, biomedical crisis or health crisis as a specific issues uh, in terms of quality and accessibility uh, of the people into the health uh, service provision as uh, maybe before our uh, previous uh, speaker told us. Uh, Insightfully about uh, healthcare, and then uh, it's it's also not about people or class relations in accessing this uh, health provision, but also uh, in equality and inequality among the states in assessing that uh, 
uh, that health service provisions. And you know, I'm not talking longer than about that because you we have been accustomed to to engage with that issue like uh, vaccine provision, and then we have a discussion about uh, vaccine nationalism. Even now, we talked about uh, virus nationalism. If you're not being uh, obedient to this. Uh, World Organization dictates, and you'll be cursed to have a kind of a, a virus nationalism, maybe. Uh, and then we have uh, the third is it's internal political rivalry. It's here. Maybe uh, this kind of internal political rivalry, meaning uh, this pandemic, it's like a Pandora box. Uh, it uh, it open up. Or revive the existing or, or conflicts in the state, uh, in, in, in the region, or especially in the state, in the country, and then uh, all these forces, all political forces, uh, seek to use the possibility or the opportunity as political opportunity, you know, to to oppose or criticize or to even or to overthrow the government for, for, for example, for failing. Uh, uh, for failing to or prevent uh, uh, death rate in, uh, in in the pandemics uh, relating to the, the COVID, um, and also uh, all or the regimes or the rallying government, uh, rallying political forces uh, seek to uh, by making use this quote unquote crisis, this uh, disaster, uh, as a pretext. Uh, to continue their um, control over, even de deepen their control over uh, their oppositions and to shut down the lockdown, the voices, the presence of this, uh, this uh, alternative or possible ideas uh, into the political affair or in, into the policy, policy, making, policy making process relating to the, what is called disaster. That's, uh, what we are witnessing today, maybe in Indonesia, for example, we uh, it's strange but also interesting to see uh, there is no such uh, phenomenon. Uh, at least we are uh, witnessing now. But what we see is the like uh, two seemingly or uh, assumedly, uh, I'm sorry, allegedly uh, uh, opposed uh, forces now since last year being in one seat in one house and. Uh, are consolidating uh, even more uh, stronger around one person. Uh, to what extent it creates kind of a, a national oligarchy and, 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 and also to perpetuate the power of the president today in Indonesia. I, this is, uh, we leave this debate uh, or discussion in, in another uh, time or in another place. So that's the... The third one, internal political repulsion related to the pandemic. And we, in Global South, we, 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 we have this story. Uh, and then, and the fourth one, I, I, just want, uh, just, I just want to introduce this. It's about, about discourse about science deficit or technology deficit, you know. This is uh, important uh, when we talk about the Global South, you know. That is, during the pandemic, uh, we see about the... If, if you are not want to be vaccinated, vaccinated if, or if the regime uh, refuse to, uh, you know, have a national vaccination, uh, then you have a story about a science deficit or anti-science uh, uh, far right or whatever. You have the story, but that's what you have Bolsonaro, you have Trump before, you have even Boris Johnson and even Putin in the in the first part of the pandemic's uh, uh, outbreak. So. Here we have a story about science matters, but what kind of science? And let me uh, tell you that, or let me argue here, this is a kind of corporate science that now dominates our discourse about health during the pandemics, not the science as we understand it. For example, and then this, it's directly relating to the Global South uh, discussion uh, because it's talking about nature, about ecology, about our body. And uh, when this kind of uh, science of fear, if, we, uh, if you, if you uh, accept it, is that uh, we can no longer trust our body. Our body cannot heal yourself. 
ourselves. Even our nature, Mother Earth, cannot heal yourself. So you need a vaccine or you need something else outside external to your body. You need drugs, maybe you need biotechnology uh, and you need uh, uh, biotechnology in the sense, uh, many drugs and others to heal you because now we are living in a permanent biological and ecological crisis. And these issues and this notion, this propaganda or this uh, disseminations of a kind of new science that, and even to the extent that, if you may, that the, the primacy of the science, you know, the, 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 the success of the science, it, if it cannot, if it can reveal that the virus more genuine than the science itself. And it's very dangerous. Now this is very serious. And it also directly uh, uh, draw our attention, draw our attention to uh, how Global South experience with ecology and biology uh, responds to this. If you follow uh, the steps of uh, Fandana Ziva, for example, who are uh, really resisting this, uh, kind. and not not only Fandana Ziva, there are many others uh, people like uh, like her. Okay, that's uh, for. Uh, for trends or for ways of understanding that I, I want we we really uh, addressing this seriously because of this approach uh, has its own has its own uh, political economic uh, interest uh, implication influence and uh, even policy implication and and that's why it matters for uh, our, our uh, understanding. But ours is that. We need to look at the contest between transnational, transnational, transnationalist economic forces behind geopolitical force, that ours. Comparing to the four, to, to, to the four approaches, we are focusing not, uh, for example, in the first one, talking in a, a global governance crisis, as uh, just like that, but we are talking about Today we are during the pandemic. We are witnessing, or we are entering uh, in the in a world of a contest between transnationalist economic forces behind geopolitical powers. It must be clear about that. So when we're talking about China and United States conflict, meaning we're talking about those transnational forces, economic forces especially, uh, behind this uh, state power that grabs the state powers and try to control them in uh, in their uh, search for. Uh, or struggle or conflict over uh, or controlling resources across uh, the region. Sorry, Mas Vicky. Yeah. Um, you have been speaking for 20 minutes. Would it be possible to make a conclusion ah, in, in three minutes? I've been talking 20 minutes. So, a lot of stories that I haven't told. So, um, okay. Okay, just may, may I have five minutes, Alif? Um, what about three minutes and a half? Okay. okay. <laughs> And then we, then we have any discussion if uh, our, our, our participant want to ask. Um, but the story, but why transnational force is important behind this uh, geopolitical force during the pandemics, because we have a story of global war on terror, okay? We have a story of global war on terror that uh, becomes the moment of uh, rallying class or global consolidation among this global rallying class, okay? Uh, so we have now, even today, we have uh, uh, Bezos and others, for example, they are now behind this, uh, or controlling this uh, industry, uh, security industry in uh, Pentagon and uh, even in, uh, it's, it's very dangerous. That's why I, I'm talking about, uh, I'm so sorry, it's time. I'm, I'm talking about before, talking about uh, how, how this pandemic can go nuclear. Okay, and then, uh, so if you are talking about what is to be done in the Global South, I just want to jump, yeah. First of all, uh, Mas Alif and friends is that, let's talking about as Fijai talking yesterday. Let's talking about, uh, or as our uh, previous speaker Mba, um, Mba Dike uh, told us, let's talking about crucial issue relating to democracy among the uh, issues of people, issue of their, uh, that matters for them. Though it's a separate issue, there's a variety of issues, but let's consolidate this issue becomes democratic issues and bring this issue into the state. 
challenging to change to challenging the the way uh, our national or regional uh, alliance or national leaders uh, uh, shape our ways of thinking our ways of accepting this the policy they are making without us or without the people that's that's the point the democracy matters and the second is mas alif and friends is about because the area of the conflict during and in post pandemic era is around us in Asia, Central Asia, and in even in a Southeast Asia. So, and, and anticipating that, that the conflicts going nuclear, not only going viral, but nuclear, and it's, it means meaning that in five minutes you are in flesh. So it's very important for the Indonesian state and other state in the global South to consolidate their uh, interest uh, to interact uh, more actively, to find a common ground, not only just to inform health crisis no longer, but even beyond health crisis, talking about the effect of this conflict among uh, two superpowers. I'm sorry, Alif and friends, a lot of sorry behind this statement, big statement, but uh, uh, if you uh, really want to explore, please ask the question and we will discuss later in the uh, Q&A uh, session. Thank you, okay. Alif and friends. Yep. Thank you very much. Again, an interesting presentation. Um, some key points that I can interpret or understand from the presentation um, is that we need to understand the current global situation as a result or as an expression of a confrontation between two major transnationalist economic forces that are in control of major or great powers, which are the US and China. And in order to address this situation, it is extremely essential to return to issues that are actual, that actually matter for the people and for global South states to consolidate a common ground beyond the issue of health crisis and emergency. Now I open the question and answer session. Um, I'm going to take three questions and then ask our speakers to answer or to address the question. Um, the, do we have any question from the audience? You can raise your hand. Um, yes, please, um, Trevi, would you mind to introduce yourself um, to whom the question is addressed and then deliver the question? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mas Ali. So, Hi everyone, my name is Trevi. I'm from uh, Universitas Gejah Mada. And my question, I will address my question for Mr. Uts Pip, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, my question would be about the digital inclusion in Indonesia. So I'm interested in some of the um, objectives that Uts has proposed in the presentation before about the digital ID framework and like getting more people uh, to get into and enter the digital economy. Um, in that sense, uh, I think I have some um, concerns or, or probably I would, I would like to, to ask that when we are looking at the aspect of digital inclusion, often we are looking at the establishment of infrastructure and like internet connectivity and getting more people to enter this environment, this new environment. However, um, currently, I think we are facing many issues. First, about the cases of data breach that is uh, often also uh, targeted uh, towards government bodies and institutions in which um, citizens' data are uh, being compromised. And also, the in the digital economy, we've seen many cases of like mistreatment of gig workers as seen in the e-commerce sectors. Uh, I think that also happens globally. And also with, uh, we are talk when we are talking about the internet connectivities around uh, Indonesia, it is, um, we see that, you know, like we have the connection in some uh, areas. However, uh, we also have some, uh, a, a relatively low literacy skills in uh, some islands. So 
when there is internet connection with low literacy skills, what happens is just like, you know, like the spread of uh, misinformation and misinformation and all. So uh, I would like to ask in your opinion, in this case, where we're looking at the digitally inclusive Indonesia and with some hassles and uh, issues regarding uh, the mistreatment of gig workers and also um, the low literacy skills and the case of like uh, government's um, mistreatment of uh, citizens' data, for example, how could we achieve that objective uh, in the future for a digitally inclusive Indonesia? Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the question. Do we have um, other questions? Um, the audience can raise um, his or her hands and you can also type your question in the chat box. Do we have questions? If we do not have a um, question yet, I'm going to ask perhaps one or two questions. My first question will be addressed to all of the speakers. Um, despite the fact that the presentations were very different, they have really um, different orientations and also normative commitment. I think one thing that connects all the presentations is that they are in one way or another concerned with the possibility of inclusion. Uh, my question is, how will the speakers, how would you conceptualize and understand the idea of inclusion? And how, how can this, this idea or this idea of inclusion can be achieved um, theoretically or practically based on your own um, context and presentation? That will be my first question. But, and by asking or by delivering that question, I want to actually um, tease out the possible differences of how our speakers understand this very idea of inclusion. And my second question will be addressed to the second speaker, um, Dia Kusumaningrum. My question is, why should we consider university as a possible site of transformation? What makes university special, given that in the past, it has made significant contribution to the reinforcement of asymmetric power relations um, in the country. And I also have one more question for France for the last speaker. And it is about um, your argument that transnationalist economic forces are behind the pandemic. If, if I believe that I am simplifying and perhaps misrepresenting your argument. But my question is, how can you show that this claim is, is valid? Because in the previous seminar session yesterday, I think it was from Professor Rao Smith, he um, argues that it will be quite dangerous if we try to, underst to understand existing global dynamics simply as a result of capital interaction of competing economic interests. That will be my question. The first is on inclusion addressed for all the speakers. The second is for Dia on why university is special if I'm not mis misunderstanding your idea. And the last is for France, it is about how can we prove or how can we know that transnationalist economic forces are actually behind the global confrontation caused by the global health emergency? Do we have other questions? If not, perhaps I will um, ask Uts to answer the questions that, has, that have been addressed to you. Oh, we have one more question from, from Nabila. Please introduce yourself to whom the question is addressed and, and the question itself. Good afternoon. Thank you for all the presenters. My name is Nabila. Um, I would like to 
uh, ask a question to the second speaker, Mbak Dia Kusumaningrum. I, I think the, pre the presentation given was very, very interesting and very eye-opening. I would, however, ask about your points on inclusion and intersectionality, I think. You propose that um, it has to be beyond this, the current inclusion that includes including a child of political, politi political dissident, if I was not mistaken. Um, what would you propose the standard of um, the university applied? as uh, seen that these children of uh, political dissidents, they, they could probably be systemic, systemically disadvantaged in their prior education. Would you propose a transformation in the university standards as well when they want to accept these students in including or including the students in, uh, in the university? Or is it within this, the the same framework of um, policy. And actually, this is uh, two questions, sorry. The second one is also to Mbak Dia Kusumaningrum in regards to unionizing. I think it's really, really interesting that uh, unionizing should go beyond uh, corporational unionize, uh, unions. However, I would like to know what is your take on the issue of, um, I don't know if you are, um, familiar with the issue, but it's uh, a lecture in Aceh who criticized the university for the uh, allegedly corrupt system implemented in the technical, f uh, in the engineering faculty. So how, how would this pitching of yours, uh, pitching idea of yours work when, it, when the lecture itself is uh, constrained within the university system with uh with the law that is much beyond the university i guess that is my question thank you um thank you for the question now um perhaps we can ask our presenters to answer the question um i'm going to give the first opportunity or Uts to respond to the question. I believe that you have two questions addressed to you. The first is on the digital inclusion, how can we achieve that? And the second is how perhaps you or the World Bank understand the idea of inclusion. Yeah, perfect, excellent. Like, thank you so much. Um, also like, thank you uh, to the two presenters afterwards. Uh, I felt these uh, presentations were like, uh, like really uh, inspiring and, um, and create, of course, a lot of thought. And, and a lot uh, to discuss. So on the um, on the two questions, um, which I think are also very thoughtful, the first one, I, I'm gonna switch the questions because I feel like the uh, the second question is sort of like the broader cap a question about like the uh, the inclusion, how to conceptualize it. I think, um, well, let's say it like this. I mean, obviously we could probably organize a whole seminar on the discussion of how to define inclusion, how to like measure inclusion. And then of course the third part of like, how can we improve inclusion? Um, so I'm going to give like sort of like a very short, simplified answer. I hope it's still helpful. I think um, from the perspective that we have, um, we do look often at inclusion in terms of opportunities for all. And um, and then like with this concept in mind, we basically try to um, ensure that um, that we can sort of like measure it and, and understand um, and, and make suggestions based on this. Of course, there's, as I've said, like a lot of many additional facets to it. And so, I mean, if you um, think of like the World Bank um, uh, goals, you know, we have two goals. The first one is to eradicate poverty, obviously, because we feel that there should be no person in the world which actually who actually um, has to live in poverty. Um, and so this, of course, also has implications on what I've said before in terms of like same opportunities for all, because same opportunities for all is not enough if it would still end up in people living in poverty. So that was like the one remark I wanted to make. And the second remark that I'd like to make, and this comes to the second goal of the World Bank, which is shared prosperity, like boosting shared prosperity. And so we feel it's also not enough for countries just to grow and then to hope that, well, the growth is going to sort of like trickle down to everybody in the society. But we feel that we need to make sure that countries basically reduce uh, inequality. And by that, for example, we mean, and of course, like we look a lot at like the economic aspects of it. Um, we feel it's not enough if 
let's say, the high income earners in the country have a certain growth rate and the rest of the society has a lower growth rate. So an average growth rate is not enough anymore to sort of like judge and see whether countries do something towards better equity. And so we feel very strongly that actually the bottom 40% of, uh, of a country should have a higher growth rate than the average growth rate of the country, or in other words, than um, the ones which actually already are richer. So this means that we very actively think in terms of policies to make sure that we reduce inequality over time. And um, we, rather than having a divergence in a country, we basically have a convergence going on. So that's sort of like the aspects of inclusion. And you can, of course, like see that this is um, like, well, um, come back to this quite a bit in the presentation that I gave. So let me quickly move to the second question, or like, well, the first question that was asked about digital inclusion. These are, I think, exactly the right questions. I can quickly say something, especially about the data breaches and the low skill level, but I can also very quickly comment on the treatment of gig workers. So on the data breaches, I mean, I'm very glad you brought it up. I actually um, wanted to mention this in my presentation, but um, well, I, I was uh, running against the time, so I didn't really have time to get into this. Um, as part of one of the policy recommendations, and you can find the details in the report, we do feel it is really important to put into place guardrails to protect against the risks of breaches of privacy, but also exclusion and also price discrimination, so that it does not only create trust, but it actually also creates an inclusive digital economy. And so this is, of course, of fundamental importance. Again, one can say a lot about what is the right frameworks for like data protection and so on, uh, but I'm not going to delve into this, but the report definitely has a little bit more detail on that. On the low skill level, like um, digital literacy in a sense, yes, I mean, this is absolutely true. And I mean, we do make this uh, point also like much stronger in the report in our second recommendation, make the digital economy work for all. It does include very specific um, upgrading of skills, um, uh, of digital skills for everybody in the society so that can, people actually feel comfortable of using um, the, the digital economy using like uh, mobile phones and accessing digital services. And of course, I mean, this becomes like from fundamental importance. If you like think about government offering more and more services with higher quality or like with other better characteristics online, well, the more important it is to make sure that actually everybody can access them and you don't want to leave the ones behind which actually cannot or don't have the skills to access those. So this is not um, sort of like a very simplistic approach where you quickly sort of like digitalize everything. But Improving the skills, building up the skills is really important. And at the same time, making sure that people who do not manage to build up these skills still have access to services is really, really important. And so I, I should have emphasized this a little bit more in, in, the, in the presentation. The last point on the treatment of gig workers, I mean, that's, of course, important. And I mean, gig workers, they might sort of like um, be in a situation where they are more subject um, to, uh, let's say, like harsh treatment or like treatment that we wouldn't want to see. Um, but generally, I think this is also like a discussion that you would want to have, not only specifically for gig workers, but basically for all the workers in, 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 the, um, in the country. And it is important to make sure that their rights are protected. And I think there is a lot to be said in terms of like policies, but also in terms of like frameworks, legal protection and so on, but also like factual and actual protection. I don't want to go uh, into it because I also want to give some time for the uh, other speakers, but I think it is a really, really important topic. And thank you so much for bringing it up. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, and then I would ask the second speaker, um, Dia Kusumaning Room, to provide your responses to questions that have been addressed to you. Um, the first question from me is on inclusion, the idea of inclusion. How would you understand that? And then you also have two additional questions on the children of political dissidents on how they should be treated. Or is there should there be any standard on how the children of political dissidents will be treated in university. And the second is constraints, undemocratic constraints within the university. And oh, and I also have one more question on why university should be considered as a site of transformation. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the questions. Um, inclusion, it's, it's a broad topic and as Uts have mentioned, you can make series of seminar uh, on this. So I don't think I can do justice to, you know, to this uh, topic. But uh, what I have touched upon a bit in my presentation is inclusion is not just a matter of, uh, you know, performing political correctness, but for universities, it can be uh, pushed more towards reparation. And um, and which which later will I will um, you know use 
this thing to uh, link to Nabila's question. Uh, we should not be, we should not forget that inclusion is a very power laden concept. Uh, inclusion is something to be fought for. I don't think uh, inclusion has been, you know, there because uh, it's like given, it's, it's extended peacefully to the excluded, but it's, uh, it's something that uh, we need to fight for. And therefore, linking to my other uh, recommendations, uh, for us to bring about meaningful inclusion, we have to normalize resistance. We have to normalize unionization. We have to normalize anxieties and even anger uh, that are you know, revolving around social uh, injustices and uh, exclusion. We cannot just you know, criminalize them or like sideline them as, uh, uh, oh, you, um, you know, you asking for more and you cannot just you know just diminish them uh, for that but you have to uh, acknowledge the right for people to be anxious to be uh, angry when they are not uh, included uh, inclusion should not be something defined by those already included but those uh, but by those that has been excluded or have been excluding themselves. And uh, from here, I would uh, run to uh, Nabila's uh, question. Uh, in my presentation, I mentioned that, uh, you know, inclusion and intersectionality, it's all good and we have to, uh, you know, keep holding on those principles, but we can go beyond that and think of them in terms of uh, reparation. Um, you know, to be very broad, um, children and grandchildren of political dissidents are not the only ones who've been um, you know, at the receiving end of uh, harm that are caused uh, or perpetuated by universities. So that's just like one uh, example. But uh, for any meaningful reparation, I believe that it needs to be survivor-led. It needs to be community-led. So we cannot just you know, change our uh, admission requirements, you know, just like give uh, scholarships to the sons or daughters of uh, the fallen and, uh, um, you know, we cannot just do that assuming that that's what they want. What if this very institution of uh, universities is seen as being at the core of uh, the problem they are facing at the day-to-day -day level. So, of course, they don't want to be part of university. So, like, you're simply thinking of extending scholarships, extending admissions and stuff like that won't solve the problem, uh, at, at least not in a meaningful way. In a PR, lip service, political correctness, you know, makeup, it may look like, oh, UGM or, like, other universities is doing reparation. But What's needed is like a meaningful dialogue between the universities and the various uh, communities that they have harmed uh, out there on how universities uh, could, you know, help overcome injustices. And this may be, uh, or this may necessitate universities to stop doing something, you know. And and this 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 will impose like a big uh, moral dilemma, economic dilemma financial dilemma to the university, but it is what it is. So we need to start these conversations, these difficult conversations going, if we want really a meaningful uh, relation with um, the communities. Uh, about the lecturer in Aceh who's been criminalized for, um, for um, speaking against corruption, well, that's exactly my point. There's no lecturer union all around Indonesia. Like other lecturers are just like, oh, thank goodness it's not me. Thank goodness when I said it in my class, nobody uh, taped me and then made this viral. You know, instead of everyone then trying to say the same thing, right? To unionize, to stand for this, uh, for this lecturer. Like every lecturer who believes in the same thing should like go to the police office in their own cities and like, you know, if you catch him, catch me too, catch me too. So like if you have two million university lecturers doing that, like the whole um, teaching, um, you know, um, schedules and everything at university will be put at halt. And that is how 
all of us will um, will get hurt. So unionizing. This is. Uh, thank you for bringing up this example because this is actually a very good um, illustration on why we need to unionize now. And uh, for Alif, why universities need to be uh, locus for transformation? Well, to be able to effectively challenge the system, I believe the change needs to happen, not just in one locus, but in uh, various loci. And universities is just uh, one of them. And it happens to be uh, the place, the space where I work, where I am familiar with, where I think I can, I have a better chance in uh, pushing about things. So that's that's why I gear my presentation towards the role of universities. But I'm hoping that uh, my colleagues in the media, my colleagues in the health sector, my uh, colleagues in the agriculture sector and so on would come up with like similar ways of uh, together challenging this uh, system. But, you know, to be more romantic about this whole thing, um, arguably, the youngest and brightest people uh, in our societies are at this moment with us in universities. So uh, if you want real meaningful change, you have to get them to see how important this change is for their personal life, for their uh, collective uh, life. Because like, you know, otherwise, it will be very easy for them to um, to get caught up in FOMO, the four FOMOs that I mentioned before, fear of missing out on this, on that, on this, on that, and then like uh, not really taking the time in uh, universities to get connected with the world and the various injustices out there and reflect on how they can use their privileges to make about uh, change. So if not in universities, where else? We have arguably the youngest and the brightest people in our um, societies. So when you ask why universities, I ask why shouldn't universities be at the forefront of this, um, of this uh, transformation? Um, thank you, um, Dia, for the answer. And lastly, I would like to ask Franz, for to respond to the questions that have been addressed to you, it seems that both of which are coming from me. Um, the first in how would you understand and define the idea of inclusion, and especially in relation to your argument about the precarious precarization of southern productive forces, and secondly, on your argument that transnationalist economic forces are deeply influencing um, the current condition of global politics. How will you sustain or substantiate that, that argument? Uh, th thank you, Alif. Mas Alif, thank you. And I, I did enjoy listening to Mbadike, yeah, because uh, uh, that's actually uh, uh, Mbadike uh, raised points that I, I really think is very important concerning the inclusion especially i mean and then talking about how inclusion works in many issues and that's also my my understanding of inclusion alif mas alif that is uh, inclusion is political concept we we cannot uh, take inclusion as technical concept merely and this danger uh, because uh, i think we are in political science for example uh, looking at things seriously now because uh, we are now living in a uh, uh, propaganda period or manufacturing concerns and so forth. But in even in every term, every uh, words we use or phrase that not being, uh, being disseminated into the public uh, as a catch word or it's very, uh, need, need, to be, need to be interrogated and including this word inclusion. And in my view, when uh, our friends, uh, uh, colleagues here in uh, that, uh, holding this, even uh, using the terms inclusion, uh, emancipation, I think I like that way because inclusion need to be understood in parallel with emancipation, not subjugation. Because uh, you can be included, while in fact not inclusion, but subjugation. 
Oke, okay, you are like uh, being uh, what is that called uh, uh, excluded inclusion, you know, you 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 being you, you are put inside or you are uh, you are drawn into inside into the inside but in the inside you are not uh, being treated as equal or you even you are dispossessed, excluded or being irrelevant in the inclusions in the realm of the inclusions. I think uh, those Uh, political economies, uh, Mas Alifia and friends, uh, in the current political economies, uh, talking about the class of re- irrelevance, for example, though he, he is not a political economist, I mean, Noam, Noam I forget the name, the main, uh, the Israelis. Uh, Noah Harari, yeah, for example, the class of irrelevance, the dangers of this technology supremacy, and then will uh, produce this class of irrelevance. Uh, being included in in what we discussed before about digital inclusion, digital learning, digital uh, economy. But in fact, when you are uh, mobilized into this kind of uh, digital world, then where you are you are a product, or you are uh, if not you are a consumer, you are a product itself. So this is and you become a, become a, uh, irrelevant for yourself, but uh, irrelevant for for that relevant for them. In in the sense that. Uh, Maybe in the in the in the words of uh, Mas Alif, Mas know very well about that. Uh, uh, who is the name? Um, David Harvey, yeah. Uh, you become class class of disposition. Okay, it's part of a rentier capitalism and so on. And and that's where that's kind of system that we are now seems to enter. I think that's that's what I, I want to debate. And this kind of talking in political science about what kind of system we are now entering. During the pandemic and post-pandemic, uh, needs to be discussed, especially when concerning about the importance or how it re- relates to glo- the global, the question of the global uh, South. Uh, because for so long we have uh, witnessed um, how this uh, concept of capitalism, uh, global, we, we talk about capitalism, but in fact we're talking about capitalism. I mean. Sometimes you're talking about subjugation, and then you say that we, that's inclusion. That's a kind of uh, uh, what is what, what what we call it misplacement. Okay, uh, you are being bombarded with the notions of globalization, while in fact you are being in the uh, total control of capitalism. That's the meaning. And also uh, you are talking about inclusion, while in fact you are being in a total control of subjugation, uh, and give the sensation that you are being included and being given uh, uh, a certain amount of freedom and. Uh, Um, uh, what is that uh, kind of qualifications to be labeled as uh, equal with others? Well, in fact, if you look structurally, you are not equal, and you are precarious. Yeah, even not being considered as exist at all, as existing at all. Okay, that's the inclusion. I think uh, that's my way to address also the point that Mbadike mentioned. And I think that we have no point of difference there, Mbadike, about the inclusion that the inclusion political concept, but. For so long, inclusion being used as part of technocratic use, but this kind of notion, technocratic use of inclusion, meaning also political. You know, meaning it's also political by making, uh, by claiming that it is not political. Okay. So, but it's it differs quite uh, uh, greatly when you understand inclusion in terms of emancipation, and let me uh, say it as uh, in terms of democracy. You know I mean. You you being included into something not because you are being pulled into that, but you push yourself or you create the space for that with others. You create the demos in the first place. That's a union, for example, not only one union but among unions or particularities. And then you create a space of uh, uh, political articulation which link or other uh, issues, other unions, for example. And then you see you create a kind of uh, inclusion. In the and not only you part of the system, but even the system itself is being part of your project of inclusion. Uh, this is quite philosophical. I think uh, uh, my friends get my point. So that's uh, Mas Alif. That's my my uh, my my response to the question of inclusion. And and I think even those claiming that inclusion is also can be uh, something technocratic, it's also political, but based upon certain insert. Who benefits from this notion of uh, uh, inclusion as, te- as, as a, for example, as technocratic? Good governance, for example. I'm sorry, I'm very sure we talk with our friends from World Bank, and I have not been uh, 
being surprised with us here, uh, talking about good governance or governance. And we have to question about it, to what extent people being included in that. Or it is a kind of the, how the state should respond to the people and claiming that it's good or democratic. Well, in fact, it is not, uh, it's not the people, but uh, the system. Those who control the system uh, proclaiming to include those uh, below uh, and claiming that uh, the, the mechanism, the procedures already there to ensure that uh, uh, people's rights uh, are being, being ful fulfilled there. Okay. What about the, the second question? Oh, yeah, uh, once okay. yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, reporting around. Um, the second question is about uh, uh, transnational. Here, Mas Alif challenge, uh, challenging me uh, because uh, this, uh, I use the term transnationalist. But uh, uh, let me make sure here, Mas Alif, that our concept about transnationalism or transnational force is not about capitalist economic in the very strict sense. Okay. Because for us, in the, very, in the very start of this, what we call capitalism, it's also part of the state development. Uh, we are uh, belong to, and I don't know whether Mas Arif belongs to that camp too, uh, uh, be, uh, to thinking like Antonio Negri, for example, uh, or those uh, uh, thinking about empire, how cap economic, that's why we have political economy. We're talking about politics cannot be separated from economics. And state is, is, uh, is the institutions where economy and politics meets. So when we, when we talk about transnational force, meaning those who are really pretending to be trans transnationalists, actually they are pol very political since the globalization period. Okay, when we're talking about what's happening in uh, what was happening in uh, uh, 1970s, when we talk about globalization start there, and uh, there's many uh, there, there were radical changes in, in uh, global finance architectures uh, and also implications on the market and so. Since 2000, and uh, I think student in in uh, international relations knows well about it or global sociology, and then changing dramatically into the unipolarity empire when we have uh, uh, 2001 with the global war and terror, and these two decades uh, uh, bear witness to the fact that uh, unipolarity cannot stand itself, and then we have uh, the rising or the rise of. Uh, multipolarity or China, I mean, with uh, Russia and other countries, although it's the fragile one, but uh, it changed, challenged the United States and uh, and this, and those behind this empire, the United States also transnational supports, of course, you know that, about that, since 2000, and even, even since the, uh, since the uh, World War, uh, Second World War, Second World War, and also being consolidated during the globalization period up to the global war uh, period. That's on the part of the on the part of the empire or United States empire. Okay, Al Mas Alif. And then you have also transnational forces on the part of the uh, Chinese, for example. Okay, Chinese uh, China. But here we uh, thanks to, for example, people like Mitchell Hudson. People like uh, what is that, Piketty, yeah, and other those thinkers in uh, in political economy uh, came uh, mentioned about the two different kinds of two two, two kinds of capitalism. You know, first uh, China we have uh, industrial capitalism, though they are also financial, of course, uh, and we have uh, almost totally um, financial capi capitalism in uh, in the United States in Europe. And that's now why uh, United States and European Union uh, going bankrupt before, uh, I mean, people protesting uh, everywhere up to the 2019 before the pande pande pandemic uh, stroke uh, the regions. And then okay. have no longer a, a protest except uh, anti vaccine protest today or anti, -pas anti vaccine passport protest today. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm really sorry, but our our time is up for this session, I believe. So I think your answer um, will will conclude this session. Um, I would like to thank Oates, Dia, and France for giving exciting and amazing presentations. We have learned a lot from you, and also I would like to thank you for responding to our questions and. I wish you to have a very good day. Thank you very much. 
And now we are entering the second part of our seminar session. And we have, we already have our speaker here, um, Maria Tanya. Um, Maria Tanya, I hope I have pronounced the name correctly and please correct me if I have pronounced it um, incorrectly. Maria Tanya is a lecturer and research fellow at the Coral Pell School of Asia Pacific Affairs, the Australian National University. Maria's research agenda is primarily motivated by the grand challenge of understanding gendered insecurities, contestations, and transform transformative politics in the context of multiple and intersecting crises with a geographical focus on the Asia Pacific region and the Philippines. Her publications include Protests and Pandemics, Civil Society Mobilization in Thailand and the Philippines during COVID-19, Depleting Fragile Bodies, The Political Economy of Sexual and Reproductive Health in Crisis Situations, and Globalizing Myth of Survival, Post-Disaster Households after Typhoon Haiyan. Um, are you here already, uh, Maria? Who are you? Thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be joining you. Um, I extend my sincerest thanks to Gajamada University for this invitation. Um, I wish I could be there in person. Um, I am sure it would have been a very exciting time. Um, but uh, for now, I think um, I'm grateful that I'm joining you virtually. If I may, can I share my screen? Um, of course. So um, you will have 20 minutes for presentation on of Maria, and then I will send you a message via Zoom chat box indicating that you have um, passed the 15 and 20 minutes mark. Um, so the time is yours. Um, Maria, I believe you can share your screen now. Thank you. Um, so I first I'd like to um, also acknowledge that I'm joining you from Canberra, Australia, land traditionally owned and cared for by the Ngunawal people. And I pay my respect and gratitude to them because I am in this land, I'm learning and growing um, and advocating about um, issues that I hold dear. Um, so the title of my presentation um, is about the cultures of crises, and it's a new concept that I'm developing. So what I'm presenting to you today is a developing research project, and therefore I would really value your feedback, especially as this is a theme that builds on the Bandung Conference and the rich history between peoples from the Philippines, where I'm originally from, and in many parts of Southeast Asia, that idea of Pan-Asianism and um, Global South um, as uh, a core site of theorizing and challenging um, international order. So the theme of the conference is thinking about international order beyond the pandemic and repositioning the Global South. My succinct answer to that is that we need to listen to the perspectives of the global south, absolutely. But even within that, we need to recover and acknowledge the role of women from the global south and particularly third world women in not just um, resisting um, inequalities, but also theorizing the global south. And in this short presentation, I hope that we get um, an opportunity to, uh, opportunity to really have a dialogue on the ways in which we can recover and acknowledge the insights of women in our histories, in our shared histories, and moving forward to really reimagine a global order post-pandemic. So what is the problem? I conceptualize a problem, not just in relation to one crisis, but as um, my introduction mentioned, I'm really interested in looking at how different forms of crises are happening at the same time. And indeed, the most recent data from the IPCC or the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change points out that, especially in our region, um, Asia and the Pacific, we are increasingly experiencing concurrent extreme events at multiple locations. So we are talking about um, flooding, droughts, um, the pandemic, but also as we are seeing now how the pandemic is intersecting with protracted conflicts, um, uh, ongoing um, issues of poverty, violence against women, and in other parts of Southeast Asia, ongoing political upheavals. So we are in a moment of all these multiple crises occurring frequently, 
but also with greater intensity. On the other hand, based on the IPCC report as well, there is a greater need to understand the interaction effects or the linkages between responses to climate change and responses in other areas, in particular in disaster, post-disaster um, resilience projects, peace building, and, and so on. So in this an infographic from the IPCC, we could ask, for instance, how are responses to renewable energy, creating energy supply and demand um, in a uh, climate efficient way, um, has trade-offs or synergies with meeting goals towards reducing poverty and, and building peaceful society. So this is now the um, uh, research and policy agenda before us. But in understanding the occurrence of multiple crises, I approach this by understanding and recognizing that our region, Asia and the Pacific, has long been a crisis-prone region. Historically and globally, this is manifested in that peoples in our region are the most at risk of internal displacements. Um, multiple and overlapping insecurities brought about by conflicts, disasters such as typhoons and earthquakes have long caused immense debt and displacement in the region. Based on the most recent, uh, most recent set of data from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, increasingly disasters are causing the most displacement in our region. And indeed, um, according to UNHCR, our um, region accounts for one third of the total global, re global refugees um, population. And increasingly that is not just driven by conflicts, but by extreme weather events. Zooming in within the Asia Pacific, looking at Southeast Asia, we find that again, Southeast Asia is the most at risk region. This is a table based on the IDMC um, uh, data, Disaster um, Risk Reduction Index, and it tells us that Southeast Asia has uh, roughly up to three times more likely to be um, peoples from Southeast Asia are up to three times more likely to be displaced than peoples from South Asia and up to four times more than peoples in Latin America and the Caribbean. While we know based on the last uh, column here, that South Asia has perhaps the fastest rate of displacement risk, meaning they are experiencing significantly in terms of frequency, more and more disaster risks. Um, at the end of the day, there are more people um, in Southeast Asia that are gonna be affected. And that's because accounting for our population size. The most recent data, so within that region of um, climate risks and disasters and conflicts occurring at the same time, we are also seeing that Southeast Asia is distinctly and particularly impacted by the pandemic. And this is data from the most recent UN Women report showing even within our region, there are significant differences in outcomes. For example, when we look at the person of people um, and gender differentiated data in terms of access to medical care in the context of the pandemic, we see a big difference between um, Cambodia and the Philippines, as well as in Indonesia and Thailand. We see Philippines has the worst outcomes or number of people, both men and women, more than half of the population unable to access medical care. When we look at um, the outcomes in terms of mental and physical health impacts, we see that there are also um, some countries where the gender differences are most pronounced. Um, in Cambodia, roughly the same percentage of men and women um, experience mental health impacts of COVID, um, and slightly more women experience physical impact of COVID. In Indonesia, women reported greater percentage of mental health impacts than men and slightly greater um, uh, impact on the physical health. We see the same in Philippines where women almost predominantly have been uh, impacted on their mental health by COVID and, and, uh, and physical um, effects of um, COVID too. The same in Thailand with that gender differentiated outcome. So we are seeing um, a particular perfect storm, um, so to speak. It's not perfect, but it's actually the constellation of these different crises uh, shaping um, the quality of life in Southeast Asia. 
And I was reminded again, coming, you know, being born and raised in the Philippines about um, the distinct um, childhood and upbringing that I've had. Looking at um, anthropological and historical research on the Philippines, I've encountered the concept cultures of disaster. And, and one of the proponents, um, Greg Bankoff, um, pointed out that disasters have occurred with routine frequency in the Philippines, such that the threats they pose are already integrated in the schema of Filipinos' daily lives. Um, and indeed, the most recent data show that mega disasters on average um, per year in the Philippines is around 20, 20 mega disasters per year. And I'm sure that's not very different from Indonesia. Um, and what this means, therefore, is that there are cultures of disaster, which is evident in how the physical environment, being crisis prone, plays a vital role in shaping the norms and values, which in turn impacts on the design of political and economic institutions. And a good indicator of this for me is the way um, in which, hang on, I've come to be familiar with the short-term survival evident in um, how we look at um, these forms of um, everyday um, survival. Um, and I'm not sure if this is familiar with you as well. Oops, sorry. Um, but this is uh, sachets um, in our Sari Sari store. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's comparable in, um, in Indonesia. But the sachet culture for me is an evidence of cultures of disaster and cultures of crises more broadly, where people, because of um, recurrent crises and insecurities, they cannot plan long term, but have to instead plan on a short term basis. How they going to survive on a day-to-day -day basis um, in an environment that is crisis prone. But of course, there are broader implications for this. And that's what I'm interested in this new research. I'm interested in remembering and recovering if there is such a thing as cultures of disaster, or cultures of crisis in the Philippines, how might we analyze and examine that on a regional level? And I know as peoples of Southeast Asia, we know this intuitively, right? But it is rarely recognized as a source of expertise and more importantly, as a source for theorizing the global order. So in this project, I ask, what are Asia-Pacific women's, um, and to some extent also men's, traditional and everyday knowledge of crises? And how have these been strategically translated as critiques of global security or the global order? Um, and in particular, through women's regional and global activism. And I'll explain why that is an important focus. But as part of that project, I'm also interested in how multiple simultaneous and intersecting crises generate gender differentiated knowledge and activism in our region, and how these cultures of crises, and specifically the perspectives of women and men from our region, can inform ways of overcoming these intersections of multiple forms of crises that we are seeing as part of climate change. So there is a theoretical component, but there's also a policy or an advocacy in, in this project, which is really to link the expertise that are embedded and reproduced in our region to the global agenda on climate change. And to find the answers to that, I argue that we need to start with the kind of feminisms that emerge within the Asia Pacific. And in particular, third world feminism, um, as it was articulated by women from Asian and Pacific societies. We could start perhaps with Kumari Jayawardena's work on feminism and nationalism in the third world, which has since been formed as the canon of third world feminism. For her, um, women's oppression are situated within the patriarchal intersection of colonialism and imperialism, capitalism, nationalism, and militarism. And so her understanding, and broadly third world feminist, understands insecurity and crises as multiple, um, even at this, the birth of this movement. They are also importantly theorize and argue that because women's labor are considered the cheapest and largest resource with a then emerging global political economy, women, unlike men, are disproportionately disadvantaged because they were already disproportionately disadvantaged within their household as, as being not being recognized as a worker or not being recognized as 
doing productive labor, then they are all the more subjected to um, oppressions and exclusions, exclusions at the global level. There's also an important um, aspect of learning among other women within the third world and how revolutions within one country can inspire and diffuse to the revolutions in other parts um, of, the, of the third world. Lastly, there was a clear understanding that no revolution or no political project on transformation will be successful if it did not include at the very core of it, women's equality. Um, and this was speaking to women's struggles within um, the Asia and the Pacific, where women were part of political projects of social rep revolution, but were always told that their needs were secondary or that gender will come in after the revolution has been won. And so third world feminism views, no, no form of crisis solution um, will be long-term and successful if women are not included. And so in trying to understand this, um, we then have a different idea of what feminism is. Feminism that was born and raised from our region understood security and the global order within that matrix of oppression. And therefore the idea of order and prosperity and security was also intersecting. It argued and believed in the linking of, the, of economic stability with ecological sustainability, racial equality, and redistribution of wealth as ultimately, of course, anchored where it, in a world where women and men are free to live creative lives. This was the feminism of the Asia and the Pacific. But of course, I wanted to understand and test this further by looking at historically and historicizing these perspectives and how we might be able to find um, knowledges for um, addressing the climate crisis now. And in doing that, I look at three regional organizations that have emerged from the Asia and the Pacific. These are first, Dawn or Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, founded in 1984. Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, founded in 1986, or APWLD. And finally, Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, found, founded in 1993. And I look at all the publications available online from these three organizations since they were formed and used um, a qual qualitative software in vivo to analyze all these publications and the word content analysis or word frequencies from all of these the, their publications. And again, there are clear limitations for this because um, some of these organizations were not um, are not able to digitize all their publications, especially at the very foundation um, during their late 1980s and early 1990s. So there are limitations. Um, and also at the same time, um, this the data is limited to what they have publicly shared. So I cannot um, analyze um, internal um, meeting notes at this stage at least um, and proceedings. And so this is again a big, uh, qualitative content analysis of what is out there from their websites. Um, and so what did I find? This is a word cloud of all the, um, analyzing all the online publications that they've produced and that's available on the websites of these three organizations and run a word frequency. So basically all the um, documents analyze word per word and then generated a sum, summation of the top words um, in these all these publications, all three organizations. And this is the image that has come out. The top keywords, as we would see, is health, women's rights, reproductive, services, international, development, um, violence, and so on. This to me is already telling um, a lot of stories, but let's disaggregate this by decade. And I'm conscious of time, um, uh, uh, Arif, so I'll go through this carefully, um, but also quickly. So this is um, when we break this down per decade. So the decade of the 1980s, when they were first forming, um, these are the top words. Um, so I put it not in a word cloud, but in this um, format. The top words were women, world, third, as in third world, development, poor, food, and work. 
At the birth of these movements, they were theorizing and understanding security and the global order with these top concepts. There was a clear understanding of development, but not in its uh, neoliberal or um, narrow economic development sense, because as we see interrelated concepts to these top keywords are issues also of basic income, land, and visions for visions for alternative visions of the global order, debt, as in the debt crisis uh, of structural adjustment programs at that time. There was also a clear idea of um, uh, violence, control, impact, the home, and so on. In the 1990s, they've looked at, um, and bearing in mind, 1990s was a period of, for us, the Asian financial crisis, um, the avian uh, flu pandemic, um, but also mass democratization in our region, um, and so on. And yet, these are the top keywords that they produce. Health, women, development, population, economic, abortion, family, um, and rights. A very different contrast to the dominant ideas at that time. In 20, 2000 to 2010, again, a global decade marked by the global financial crisis, the global war on terror, um, and another pandemic, the core concepts that they've written about were women, health, rights, um, development, uh, again, but not an economic development, a more broader social, political, one that actually also understood the importance of environment because we start seeing mining coming up as a core concept. And then finally, from 2011 to the present, um, where we've seen, again, global um, significant transformations and crises, the core concepts that they produced are women, health, development, care, um, and that's a way to process other issues such as climate change as we see here. So what does this mean? For me, this is, and this is where I ask for your advice, right? What does this mean for us? If we are seeing these as the way they've theorized and understood what made women insecure, but more than that, what makes all of us insecure, um, it already tells me a lot about the current situation we are in with the pandemic. Perhaps we would have been more prepared. Perhaps we, have, we would have been better um, able to address a multiplicity of crises had we listened to and had we taken the, the, the insights and expertise of these women's regional networks early on. There was already a strong emphasis on health and development as a way of cushioning us from all these um, uh, shocks and upheavals and catastrophes. But perhaps also importantly, it has, it, this is telling us that in an era of increasingly multiple crises, we need to listen, value, and act on the basis of global South women's perspectives of peace and security. This is not simply that we reposition the global South in relation to a changing global order, but rather that we recognize the centrality of the perspectives of our peoples, um, that we have lived and survived many, many crises in the past our ancestors, our predecessors. And it is now our opportunity to really, through, through issues of justice and equality, actually make a very central contribution for addressing the climate crisis. And I really um, would like to end there, but emphasize that I would love to hear your feedback. I have much to learn from, especially scholars, um, interested in really challenging um, knowledge production and centering the global south um, to this research. So I'll end there and I hope I didn't go over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. It is an extremely interesting presentation, your argument about how that the evolution of no, the, no, the evident knowledge of women in Asia Pacific can be read as changing theories on how to be secure is, is extremely interesting for me personally. So I would like to open the question and answer sessions. Um, the audience, you can raise your hand or type your question in the chat box if you have something that you want to ask or if you want to provide some feedback um, to Maria. Do we have any questions? Um, if there's no question, I have some 
some question for you, um, Maria. This may sound a little bit too basic, but I was I was really curious about this. The first is on the use of term of everyday knowledge of crisis. Um, how would you define or interpret the idea of the everyday knowledge uh, and how it differs from other forms of knowledge? What makes this, then this knowledge everyday and what makes this everyday knowledge unique in, in itself? And the second question is, I think you may have this question already in your mind is how can we explain the evolution of the changing of the everyday knowledge of women about crisis in Asia Pacific? I'm not sure whether your research um, has performed this analysis, but in, in your speculation, perhaps, what, what factors that, that may affect the evolution of the knowledge on how to be secure in Asia and Pacific and how this knowledge formed. I think that would be my two questions um, for you. Do we have other questions? Um, look, Manuel Hakim, please. Perhaps you can introduce yourself first. Um, okay. just in case. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, presentation and I really interested it on the ideas because you know uh, the last two days we have a different uh, conceptions and it is very contested on how do we imagine a global south uh, whether global south is you know be understood through the approach of how global structure constitute global south or uh, global south by using the nations as a categories of uh, analysis and uh, from you uh, we learned that uh, imagining global south can be you know uh, quote unquote ethnographically and sectorally uh, you know centered around uh, the, the categories of uh, of women and which is uh, very important you know of how do they define uh, the crisis will also result will you know more and less bring about the conceptions on the conceptions of uh, uh, resilience and of course the challenge uh, there are, there will be two challenges in uh, my opinion uh, first is that uh, how to um, not to generalize, but you know, to, to produce this this knowledge as something that uh, we can uh, apply or calibrate the the impact uh, on uh, on uh, on the level of of global south. For example, how do we build the solidarity uh, you know network based solidarity based on these conceptions in challenging the con the dominant conceptions of uh, vulnerability and risk that you know often promoted by, for example, uh, global financial institutions and others. That the first uh, issues and. Uh, the second one uh, is much more uh, methodological. I mean, uh, it is interesting, you know, starting from uh, ethnographic ethnographic point of view from uh, women as a uh, you know group of women in particular areas, as a you know uh, as a part uh, as a starting point. But uh, the thing is that uh, their discourse, their uh, you know uh, conception, their narrative of crisis and you know uh, you know simultaneously uh, resilience is also uh, you know a product of you know uh, a lo long uh, long history not from uh, their own including their encounter with culture their encounter with uh, economic structure and so on and so forth so uh, how uh, should we deal with you know such uh, methodological uh, issues so we, we we could bring this research much more uh, rich not only in terms for you know in terms of uh, ethnographic as ethnographic but uh, we put ethnographic in a bigger uh, political economic uh, context thank you um thank you um Lukman, do we have other questions from the audience oh. yep Mas Ali. Uh, uh. is someone speaking yeah hey, uh, yeah vicky please uh Mas vicky yeah uh Thank you, Maria. It's a great uh, presentation, and I uh, did enjoy uh, listening to you. And I, I, I find out that what you presented, uh, what you argued here, it relates to us, uh, our, our topics before, and also uh, the speakers, maybe Mardike. Um, and it's interesting because you raise uh, one central issue concerning uh, not only practice, but I think it's also important concerning knowledge productions of women, of gender, in relation to work, in relation to natures, and so forth. And uh, 
I, I'm not a gender, uh, uh, gender what is it? I'm not, uh, my, my, my focus of study not on, on gender, I mean, or woman, but believe me, I, uh, I know about that too. Uh, for example, in Indonesia, I just want to share my, my brief, uh, brief review or experience with this issue. Uh, in the southern part of Indonesia, or not southern part, eastern part of Indonesia, uh, where I belong, uh, where I uh, come from. Uh, you know, the, let me state it that uh, the development there is failing the woman, okay? I mean, uh, the value of development uh, uh, exists there. And there's a trend uh, from the national policy on women up to the local government policy, because the local government just uh, implemented what the national government instructed them to do is that uh, the notion of uh, primacy of women, uh, but not a citizen, but their rights, but as uh, object of interventions. This is very clear. And the danger is even those activists on women and, and organizations celebrate this and uh, tipping on these government uh, uh, policies to promote this, to, to prolong this, uh, which I think it's part, uh, it's a very cruel one because it's uh, uh, uprooted women from their rights to voice their body, to voice their, uh, their uh, economic uh, security, their uh, integration into wider uh, public affairs, including education, uh, not to mention health. Um, so my point is what we find in Indonesia or in my experience in Easter, uh, in, in uh, uh, eastern part of Indonesia. So I'm from Flores, from Pap I'm talking about Papua, about uh, East Nusa Tenggara, about Maluku and North Maluku, uh, not far away from you uh, in Filipina. Um, is that uh, there is no institution like uh, organization of movement and uh, no effort at uh, institu politically institutionalizing them. Uh, uh, for them to voicing, voicing their rights. You know, political party, okay, we have a, a, a politician, woman, polit female politician, but this is, this woman belongs to the upper class in our society, okay? They are a, they are a wife of the a former regent, former governor, and so forth. So they, actually, it's only body as woman, but their thinking not belongs to the, what we perceive as human matters. Uh, women, women affairs in the context of the working class, they belong to the upper class. So no hope uh, that can be counted on them for the futures of the um, women. Sorry, <laughs> Mas Vicky, yeah. yeah. My question, I'm sorry, I really enjoy it. My question is, uh, Maria, uh, this is my, our experiences. There is no ins political institutionalizing of this uh, woman's right and they are their agency to be politician and other uh, form of uh, of articulation. So whether in your experience in Filipina, with the story you tell us, uh, do you have there a kind of uh, political institutionalization of this human uh, concessions or counter, counter uh, narratives uh, and turning into politics era formally or officially uh, challenging the official narrative on them in Filipina? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mas Vicky. And would you mind to respond to the questions and comments, Maria? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just really blown away by all the questions. Um, they're all very helpful. Thank you. Um, I've listed them down, um, but and I'll answer them one by one. But if I miss, um, please feel free to remind me that I've forgotten. So I think the first question from Alif, um, it wasn't, it's not a basic question. It's actually at the heart of this, um, this issue. So the reason why I emphasize everyday knowledge and, and how that's different, um, especially because within the climate um, uh, scholarship and agenda, there's an emphasis on scientific knowledge. So uh, knowledge um, on how we understand um, climate change um, uh, has a, an overemphasis on um, the expertise produced by scientists. Um, and, and there's a growing interest now, even Maurice, the last report by IPCC actually recognized, okay, actually we can't just rely on scientific knowledge. We need to have the knowledge of the people from the grassroots. So their traditional knowledge. Um, and, and this is so, this is an important and we find 
for us, right? There's a recognition that peoples, especially indigenous peoples, have actually long survived and adapted to a lot of these um, catastrophes, and that's the, and that's their everyday knowledge, and that's cultures of crises. Um, if we think about Southeast Asian peoples, um, you know, we have, um, if we do, if we unless we fail to record and document, we have had a lot actually of expertise, and and not just um, in the good way, right? We also have um, expertise on the bad ways <laughs> when you know crises fails, when crises response fails, like um, you know what we're seeing now with the pandemic. That is our knowledge, right? Um, but how we understand that, um, and I'm thinking of. Myanmar, for example, um, where you have flooding, conflicts, coup at the same time. And again, not very foreign to many of us um, in Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand. Um, that is knowledge of the worst that can happen if we see climate change continuing in the rate that it is. So that is our everyday knowledge. Um, and then to the question of is my project going to account for the evolution of their ideas? Absolutely. But this is where I'm struggling because, you know, there are ways of clarifying this. But is this are our cultures of crises shaped or catalyzed by crises or is it the other way around that we are kind of interpreting these and making sense of crises through our own um so that's such absolutely that's an important thing that i will look at um i don't know yet um because actually yeah, I have a suspicion that maybe these crises are shaping how we make sense of security, but also at the same time, we bring lessons from other crises. So I'm thinking, again, for places where there's been conflicts and repression, how responders on the ground um, are actually doing applying lessons they've learned from other crises response. So in the Philippines, I'm in looking at Mindanao, for example, I've had interviews with um, uh, humanitarian workers where they said, oh, we've learned uh, responses because conflicts are increasingly seasonal and disasters are increasingly violent. So we've had to really integrate both projects. So we employ conflict prevention in disaster response, you know? And so those are, again, innovations from our region. Um, but I don't know, yeah, what is the relationship between the two? And, and the point, um, I think this is Lukman's point on imagination and the global South. I really wish I could have attended all of the, con uh, all of the sessions, but it's hard with the different time zones. Um, but I think, um, yeah, this is where I think I'll be integrating Benedict Anderson's, you know, that classical imagined communities and, and how I think Global South is imagined. Third world, um, third world feminist uh, movements imagine their shared experiences, but there are also specific processes where they develop and talk to each other, which is happening in the past and now, which has happened in the past and happening now, where women from uh, all over um, Asia Pacific come together through their regional um, networks to discuss about what are our shared oppressions or what are our shared insecurities. And, and again, speaking to Indonesia and Philippines, we have our long history of, of this, especially in the South and Philippines, of informal networks of peace um, and kinship um, that tie us together as an imagined community. And, and absolutely, that is the challenge. Um, but I, I agree, we need to think about how do we, we know it's imagined, but how do we make that as a concrete contribution to challenge global agendas? But that is something that we also, again, these women's regional networks are telling us there is strength in numbers. And so this conference, I think, is a fascinating avenue to really start talking about this. And I'm hearing there are similarities um, in other parts of, of, the, of the world, especially within IR as a discipline, to really address the historical injustices through the discipline itself, right? Um, that a lot of our scholars have been written off. Um, and, you know, with the Bandung conference being recognized and more scholarship being done on this, this is amazing. And then on the point on methodology, and I think um, I can remember if it was Lukman, um, Lukman that asked this still. Uh, yes. The, so the next part of the research, this was just a starting point to look at um, the what they produced and written. The next phase is to do archival research to actually go into, and maybe it'll take me to Jakarta actually <laughs> um, in the future yeah. when travel permits, because again, there's a lot and, and to revisit Bandung uh, as well, um, because we need to understand those longer history, as you pointed out, um, to situate it, um, because these networks emerged 1980s to 1990s, but we know even in the period of decolonization, um, women from Indonesia, Philippines, um, uh, South Asia, Sri Lanka, India came together um, to 
to talk about, again, this share, shared perspective and how they were positioning. So the next phase of my research is hopefully to do archival research when COVID allows, and then to interview actually some, um, and this is where, please, feel free to send my way, um, long-term activists um, and, and women from Southeast Asia who have been pioneers um, in developing this consciousness. And then finally to um, Fran's um, question, Again, agree. I think I'm very critical of development initiatives that actually aren't in the service of gender equality. And it's actually um, uh, re-embedding um, subordinate positions of women in the name of empowering women. And this is a real problem. And again, um, this is, you know, as others have said, neoliberal um, governance and technology, where on one hand, it's championing women, but at the, at the actually, when you look at it um, more closely, it is actually just using women's labor and keeping them subordinated in very sophisticated ways. And we can and talk on and on about that. Um, but I also agree that, um, you know, when we look at these, um, this is one thing, uh, and I'm not an Indonesian expert, but I think I know a fair bit. But um, when we think about um, women in politics and leadership, they tend to still be elite, elite women. And often through relationships with political families and, and kinship networks. So same in Philippines. And I think that's not the kind of transformation that we want to see. Um, we want to really see. And when we look at third world feminist activisms, they were challenging that, right? Um, that they are speaking to, again, some elite um, class, class inequalities as well. So this does not mean. And the counter narratives is exactly that that I want to find out. Um, and it's in the past and at present, we see more um, perhaps radical resistances being done um, by women. And, and again, this often starts at the family, um, especially in Southeast Asia, because family is so strong and not just family household unit, but kinship networks, right? Um, and, and often the sources of insecurity and transformation are through these kinship networks. And so um, uh, the, the starting point for these counter narratives is to what extent extent are women able to influence their families um, to promote security? Um, and, and to what extent are they supported? Because there's also emerging evidence that um, when we expect women to do this work, they are faced with violence, right? They are also met with insecurity, um, often from their own families. And again, I know this um, more, more closely in the Philippines, but I would imagine there are parallels in Indonesia. I think I've answer those questions, but um, please feel free to, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Do we have further questions? Um, perhaps I will open the last um, Q&A opportunities if you still have questions. If not, can I ask you one more question, Maria? Um, this is something that is quite interesting for me and it is about would you consider the possibility in which the women's counter narratives, again, insecurities that they experience are being countered by perhaps the state or perhaps the elites or perhaps being tamed mm -hmm. by those in power? Would you, would you touch on um, that kind of issue in, the, in your research? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think that's, that ties in with the question on understanding the evolution of their ideas. I think we can learn a lot about the barriers and how they made these bargains and concessions along the way based on the barriers that they face. So I think um, in understanding the evolution of their ideas and historicizing their leadership, um, it's important to account for, for those things. And uh, I think that's the next phase of this research. Now that we know exactly what they've said, right? We know that um, um, across all this period of time, they, there seem to be core ideas that they articulated across this period of time. But for me, what stood out was, why don't we see that reflected at the global level, right? Um, if the priority was always health and development and development in a broader way, right, in a broader sense that was rooted in ecological sustainability, why was that not listened to? Um, why was that not reflected in these global agendas? And perhaps also recognizing that they did contribute to these global agendas. Um, you know, we talk about sustainable development goals and the emphasis on environment, but you know, if we trace back um, since their inception in the 1980s, women were talking about environment. Um, so again, those understandings, but also 
the, the, the resistance that you are see, saying, um, they've understood that as multi-layered. So they were resisting um, not just um, the global level of colonialism and imperialism, but also nationalism within their own countries, right? Um, and, and the task there is to, re and also even more within their own families. So the task there is to analyze on a multi, uh, multiple level, okay. uh, multi-scalar analysis of, of these dynamics, of how they were facing resistances and how that was shaping the evolution of their ideas. That might be a bigger project um, further down the line, but I think um, the, the, and it's part of a broader um, agenda of recovering and recognizing third world women as theorists of the global order, but it's something that can be done. Maybe it's a PhD project for someone. <laughs> um, and and happy, I'd be happy to talk, talk about that. I will apply um, for another PhD degree. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so going to be the first surprise for you. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I'm, yeah, I think this is a starting point, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of again ways to expand this. Um, so hopefully there will be an opportunity to really tease out those, um, those dimensions. But at least what I presented now is going to be part of um, a basis for an article, and perhaps a basis for a bigger book project that actually traces um, uh, the, the that longer history. And as I think, as I've mentioned, I have in mind to visit um, Indonesia when time permits, um, because I know the libraries there have fantastic resources, um, including, you know, the ASEAN Secretariat is based in Jakarta, and they have amazing resources on how women um, have shaped um, regional security through ASEAN. So that is, again, part of that um, broader agenda, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Maria. Um, I think we no longer have um, Alif, further questions. Oh, is someone speaking? Alif, me. Oh, is that, oh, please. Uh, can you make it uh, brief? Okay. <laughs> uh, it's great uh, uh, just to respond to uh, the last response, uh, Maria's last response. I think, uh, uh, that's where uh, we relate uh, your topics and uh, relates to mine before if you had time before listening to me talking about the dangers when uh, global conflicts and then affects uh, our countries in the global south and then there is a kind of uh, agreement among the states here to think that okay we are in permanent crisis so we need to develop national uh, governance uh, of permanent crisis i'm sorry uh, uh, developing uh, crisis-based governance and it, meaning crisis is permanent, no question, no democracy and meaning also at the same time relating to what Maria has mentioned is that all these alternatives, including these counter narratives, these, these, these struggles, uh, women's struggles being eliminated or if, meaning that all this talk is just in the room because in the fact that a woman that we now we are advocating uh, living in, in 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 direct economy and they are no longer be in a, uh, no longer capable of doing direct economy uh, like uh, economic perjumpan in Indonesia. I mean, you know, we are not, so this is where we have to confront also the reality of women today during the pandemics when they are losing their jobs in the markets in the way they are doing their economics uh, with the talk of the digital economy or in all its sensations about uh, uh, being part into this digital uh, uh, Hollywood world or whatever that's where the monopolizers of capitalist contemporary economy already waiting there to uh, crawl us there. So this mm -hmm. is my point, uh, how, how, the, how these struggles you, that you are advocating uh, also relates to the concern that I and Mas, I and others uh, uh, really advocating uh, to see how the possibility of bottom-up struggle, mm -hmm. but from the uh, from the top or at the top, we see uh, there's a kind of uh, containment, containment of all the struggles by uh, using this uh, or, or through these pandemics uh, mm -hmm. by creating a, a kind of a, a development governance that eradicate all kinds of narratives. Thank you. Uh, okay. That's my um, to respond to Maria. All right. Do you want to respond to that very briefly, Maria? Yeah, I think um, I think that just underscores the importance of listening to these women's regional networks because, again, they've survived and flourished from 
all these decades marked by a multiplicity of crises, especially at our region, right? They've survived and importantly, they have not lost hope, um, especially I think for, for the women in, in, in the room, um, you know, to struggle and advocate for something where it's just bit by bit, you're right? Like small changes at a time. And then even when you've made, you know, one step forward, two steps back, um, but they are still there. And, and I was just, you know, in again, in a conversation with some women activists in Southeast Asia, you know, it's so easy to lose hope and to think that um, there might not be alternatives. But since, ever since, right, they were always there. And we have a lot to learn from not just their ideas as, their, as they theorize peace and security, but even on a human level, to be an activist in our region, um, where it sometimes means um, a cost of life um, to yourself and your loved ones. We have a lot to learn and to admire and to support on that front. So I think we, again, coming back full circle to that first question, why women's regional networks? Because they can tell us a lot, right? about the current crisis that we are experiencing and how to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And that will conclude our session. And thank you very much for um, giving or sharing your exciting research. And we wish you all the best for your research. It will be very fascinating to read your final, um, the final paper or books or products of, of your research. And um, thank you, Maria. Yeah, and that will we have to make sure, Alif. Uh, I think yep. we have to make sure that this should be not the first time we will disturb Maria for inviting sure. for another. We will invite you for another forum, Maria. Yeah. Really, uh, we need to develop this, you know, as something that we could develop uh, together. Yeah, thank you. Maria. I would love that. And again, when travel yeah. permits, I hope to visit and, and learn um, with each yeah. other. And I'll bring all my um, Filipino, <laughs> Filipino <Yeah>. goods with me. <laughs> Our happy. institute will be very happy to hosting you. Okay. And thank you very much, everyone, for attending um, the, the seminar session. I just want to remind you before ending the session that we will still have three concurrent panel sessions tomorrow between 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. the morning. The first session is, the first panel will be on contesting resilience, pandemic development and resistance. The second is on theorizing global south, representation, moral basis and real politics. And the last session will be on digital global development from digital inequality to digital justice. And that will conclude our session. Thank you very much for attending the seminar and have a good day. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Alif. Recording stopped.